Tyler, I was hey. we were we were supposed to do a different intro today, and we forgot. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. We had discussed that. We had we had discussed it. I was gonna say in length, but I don't think that's fair to say. Um, but we didn't. So we're just gonna stick with our normal intro of. And you guys will just have to wait and see yeah, you'll, you'll, what, wait we and see. what we you were thinking. We might have to wait a few more weeks if we for. Because <laughs> we're gonna probably... we gotta figure out how to structure that. Because we... like at the end of the podcast, no, having them. Be, I think I think it's right at the beginning. It has to be. I think it's like, hey, by the way, we need you to do this. Yeah. All right, Make it so super awkward. Who do we got this week? Uh, Jimmy, guy named Jimmy. Mm. Uh, Duresta. Duresta. You guys likely know him. If you guys have been on YouTube and are in this industry, I would venture to say that he was probably one of the first people that you came across uh, If with anything that is maker-related. Um, Jimmy's a really cool dude, and we talk about everything from his career in toy making, um, the art world, which I am constantly fascinated by. Teaching teaching how that led to tv stand-up uh, comedy stand-up comedy the whole the 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 story i meant to say this in the podcast the story about him being in the room and when he said the producer he was like the producer literally thought about it for a minute and turned around and said all right what if you do this and that yeah it i feel like i knew i know exactly what that that scene looked like I yeah feel like that's how they perceive it on tv when it's like you go pitch something it's like nope 30 seconds 30 seconds my brain has switched all this up this is what we're gonna do what do you think yes okay now it's a tv show yeah and i'm just like and and him telling the story is just is classic um but yeah stand-up comedy uh and i do ask the question if you guys have seen his new show make uh making fun uh he talks about how he hates kids uh and i do ask him if he truly hates kids and he truly hates kids (laughs) yeah it he, uh, it's like super hard to like pin him down or like put a finger on what he is. Mm. And like, I don't know, the whole time, you know, you're seeing his content, uh, watching what he does, talking to him and like his background and how many different things that he's done and how proficient he ha- is at all of them. I'm like... I can see a lot of the artists come out. Obviously, then he's like filming. So you see the visual art background come out, but then he's welding and like there's, it's so hard. And it's almost like having the conversation with him. You get little glimpses of all of these different aspects of his life coming together. And I think by the end of the podcast in my head, I'm just like, yeah, he is an artist. Like, he has the artist's brain. It's tapped into so many different things. And it's a little bit, you know, kind of spread out all over the place, a little bit chaotic, a little jumbled, but like there's vision uh, and it's usually large vision. And it just, it's like having a conversation with an artist. Um, and it, it makes perfect sense that, you know, that's what he considers himself and a maker and all of that. Um, and you know, that his background is visual art. It, uh, it definitely makes sense to me, especially after speaking with him and guys, just bear with us for the first five minutes. We had a little bit of a mic issue, but we fixed that, uh, just about five minutes in. Yeah. Audio was rough for a few minutes, but then we, we sorted our, uh, our AV team got to it. How are you guys? Jim, Not bad, how yeah. are you? Very good, very good. Thank you. Th- thanks for uh, putting up with my bullshit. I-, I just forget everything. I just get completely sucked into the shop and I forget everything. <laughs> I don't. I don't think you gave us any bullshit. <laughs> I just kept reminding you guys. Caroline sent me like twenty emails. Don't forget oh. in an hour. Don't forget in twenty minutes. Don't forget. Oh yeah, Caroline was like, I got. I'm gonna remind him. Send me the link. Send me all the info. And I was like, Well, we were scheduled th- to Thursday. She goes, Oh my god, I need to know this stuff. I'm like, All right, all right, we got it. <laughs> how are you, man? Right on. I'm good. I'm good. I'm just chilling. I just I'm in my big shop, just relaxing. What are you Making working on? Uh, I'm working on <clears throat> a few things at the same time. I'm building a boat, a rowboat, a 14 foot rowboat, nice. kind of in the same in the same style as the canoe that I that I made over the years. The canoe is up there. Nice. 
Oh, that's awesome. There's the boat on the horses over there. And uh, I'm also working on a uh, go-kart. A go-kart? Yeah, I own a small go-kart track in East Durham, New York. It was a former go-kart track. It's a uh, heyday was like in the 90s, and then it kind of fell into disrepair. And then I bought it for the two acres. It's right on Main Street. It's like two acres on commercial, the commercial strip. So I bought it just as an investment. Sure. And the go-kart track is still there. So every July 4th, I have my fans come and bring go-karts, and we just goof off for the day. That's, that sounds amazing. And, <laughs> Because of COVID, like the things yeah. have been well. Exactly this time last year, we were shooting the show, so we finished shooting on July third, and on July fourth, I I held the event, but I wasn't able to build a go kart because of my time was taken up. And then the previous year, it was touch and go because of COVID, and so we didn't know whether we'd do it or not. And I kind of I almost didn't take it serious enough, and all of a sudden there was no time for me to build a go kart. So now here it is, the third annual, and I'm finally building a go kart. And I've inspired lots of other guys. Seem like at least like four or five other guys have been showing their builds. And some guys last year, some guy just showed up on his way up from Jersey, stopped at a face on Facebook market ad and picked up a go kart on the way up and we were playing with it. It's a lot of fun. Everyone's like all gear heads and, and engine heads are all like playing with each other's thing, trying to get the motors going. It's fun. It's fun. I think the uh, heyday of go karts was in the nineties. Yeah, apparently I realized I wasn't on the mic. Um in in a, uh, the 90s, this, this particular go-kart track, when I bought it, there was like these railings everywhere, like lanes. Like you, when you go to like Disney Park, there's these lanes so you could wait in, in a lane to get. So the first thing I did was I cut all these lanes down. They were all just made up out of like recycled fencing pipe. And uh, I said to the owners, because they're, they're local people, I still see them. I said, what, what was all this fence? They're like, you have no idea in the 90s they were we had three bouncers to crowd control. They said the parking lot would be completely jammed with cars and there'd be a line of people. The, the railings would be completely packed with people waiting to get on the go-karts. And everybody was drunk because it was like a real party town. They said it was mayhem. And then that slowly fell off over the last 20 years. Yeah, I'm one, of, zero and then, I'm yeah. one of five kids, so we didn't have birthday parties. And I had my like one birthday party at a... Uh, go-kart place called malibu grand prix i think i was like third grade and they would print you up a license that was like malibu grand prix license oh, with their picture cool. on it and stuff um but same thing it, it uh it went under and it was just vacant forever and i think a developer eventually yeah there's a lot of them up stuff. here i mean I, where i am where i am in the catskills that it was it's like a recreational area it was a vacation mm -hmm. getaway recreation my house that i bought 17 years ago was one of those houses there's like a shuffleboard table buried in the in the front lawn under the grass and uh, there was like a recreational area from the 20s until like the 2000s and all uh everything fell into disrepair and all the real estate up here was really cheap and then covid came back and brought back now everything's expensive yeah. <laughs> it's crazy it's not quite as crowded as it was as far as entertainment goes but it's crowded I'm, for people just getting away from new york i want to pause you for just a moment uh I don't know if, if the mic is under you. You're get, we're getting a lot of like noise. Like it's like you're rubbing the face. Oh, the maybe mic. I'm on the wrong mic. Let's check that. Yeah. I might be on the wrong mic because let's see. I'm probably on the headset mic and it's on my arm. It should be. Uh, Problem yeah. is the squad cast thing. I don't know exactly where the. That's so if you're going to switch uh, equipment, just X out of the screen and come yeah. back in that link. And before you sign on, it says uh, change equipment and change it in that screen. Oh shit! I can't change it here. It no, doesn't it, do anything, but you can so just X out and come back in. It won't. It won't affect anything. Yeah, it won't affect, it won't anything. affect anything. It's funny. I, I've never really thought about the go kart thing, and we we have a place up in New Hampshire, and there's a there's an active go kart track there, but I don't know of any other ones around here. And there was one outside of Boston that it was like an upscale one. You go, it's like a hundred bucks. You yeah. go there. It's like a club, like you know, fancy five star restaurant, and they're they're like legit you know race go-karts uh and the track was amazing but it was you know it was a it was a thing like it was a hundred dollars to go race for 20 laps and i just drove by the other day and they closed and wow you know it's fun i just don't know if the kids of today care about it why it, I, it, it, it's just like i mean i mean i'm 55 years old i mean you guys are obviously younger than me but 
I when I was a kid, it was you know if you aren't breaking windows at the school or drinking beer in the mm -hmm. you know in the behind the buildings or or starting engines and turning you know putting engines on go kart frames yeah. or mini bike frames. I don't it, know. I don't know what kids don't do any of that today. It is funny. I, yeah, I mean, as a kid, my my buddy had a little uh, Yamaha eighty quad, and we used to rip that yeah. thing for hours in his backyard my backyard yeah. we jump we build jumps and jump over each other film it with like a high eight tape and but yeah i guess i guess just kids don't aren't exposed to that stuff anymore we used to love messing with engines yeah like, it's you know, crazy like, you know it's like everyone's like all right how do we make this thing faster it's like we, i'm 55 my brother's 60 and between the two of us you know we're like little kids trying to build this go-kart like talking about the gearing and and now that was the, the, the hope and, and prayer when I first started the idea of opening the go-kart track once a year. Everybody would, And it's like I said, it's taken a couple of years to catch on. But now I finally see guys that I don't know personally. I know mm -hmm. them from Instagram. I never met them in person. But I see them building a go-kart. And I know on July 3rd they'll be here with it. How do we get wherever. invited My buddy, to that? I want to be invited to the You're invited. Annual. Come. July right. 3rd. You guys All are right. in California, right? No, I'm in Boston. I'm in New Jersey. Oh, you're in Boston? Yeah. Oh, why did I think you guys, like, why did I see Pacific time Nick, versus... Nick looks like California. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a yuppie. Oh, because it said, it said Pacific time, 3 p.m., 5 p.m. Really? Or 2, in, you know, whatever, whatever the map. It said Pacific time. Their, yeah, their calendar's all messed up. I don't know. Um, no, we're, I'm, we're, we're, we can drive. We'll build a modern craftsman. July 3rd. Car. Come up July 3rd. There's a lot of guys coming. Uh, my buddy Derek, uh, who's on the show with me, from, is from Malden. Derek will probably be there nice the, you you live in in the catskills i live in east durham yeah i live in this small little town it's about last census i think it said it was 1100 people in the town of east durham oh wow i happened to google that one day out of curiosity but this little town i bought this house 17 years ago on a whim when the when you all you needed was a pulse to get a mortgage mm -hmm. and so i bought this house and then a year later i bought the, the neighboring property i refinanced everything again no no doc <laughs> nothing I couldn't, I couldn't even finance a few years back you know i i'm fifty thousand times more wealthy than i was when i bought the house and they wouldn't let me <laughs> refinance um <laughs> it's funny just the way that everything has gone in reverse so I was able to uh, buy this house, not sure why I was buying it or what I was buying it for. I was living full time in New York City and I would come up on the weekends the best I could. I bought it with a girlfriend. We split up right after I bought it. And so it became my house alone. And I had the house alone for five years. And then I ended up with my girlfriend who I'm with now for about seven or eight years. No, Taylor and I've been together for 10 or 11 years. And uh, so Taylor and I have really turned this into a compound, you know, with her help and her vision. We built the barn that I'm in now, the one that's on the TV show, and we're building a horse barn in the back. And I put a blacksmith shop because we were doing classes here. So before COVID, from 16 to, to 19, we did several classes every summer and spring and fall here at the house, blacksmithing classes. So I bought a ton of blacksmithing equipment. I built a blacksmith shop and... We bought all the equipment to do knife making classes and woodworking classes. It was it was a lot of fun, and we'll still do that ultimately. But everything's been put on hold. Yes, yeah, so you're my in laws have a place in Cooksaki, um, so you're actually oh, yeah, very very here. close to them. Mm -hmm. That's Green County. That's right by the water. Yeah, they're in Green County. Um, they bought like a little lake house right before nine eleven. Um, in a small yeah. like private community up there um, and they still have it so we go up there a few times a year yeah yeah the, the green county is, is really nice it's it was one of the most depressed counties at the time when i bought it there was yeah. nothing to do here and there was no there's no workforce you know every unfortunately i i, I lucked out I, I work with a i've developed a relationship with a small group of carpenters here um there's a thing called the 12 tribes. I don't know if you guys are familiar. It's like a religious sect that mm -mm. basically they, they, they kind of look like Grateful Dead followers. They're uh, very kind, nice people. I mean, I don't know too much about their religion, but they, they very industrious and they are loyal when I need them. They're always here and you know, they kind of like my vibe. So they're always up for helping me out and doing stuff. So they're, they're building the roof on my barn. Ultimately, they'll build the, the walls out and stuff. But in general, it's impossible to get anybody up here to do anything. Yeah. The no workforce is nothing. 
it's an interesting area because you can tell like even where they are going through Catskill, all the old houses like there's a ton of really nice old architecture and some people yeah, have Coxsackie's come up over, got some nice stuff yeah like coming out you know even obviously hudson now is crazy um but like you can mm -hmm. tell at one point it was a very affluent area being right on the river um and then just sure. like even some now crazy homes that are on there yeah, there'll be like a super nice renovated house, uh, and then next to it like a trailer. Um, yeah. it's uh, it's like very polarizing. Yeah, there's there's everything up here. Trailer homes. What's crazy is I I, I mean what I paid for this house is paid a couple hundred thousand dollars for this house, and now like people are sending me links to like friends because I've got a couple friends to buy property up here, and they're like. Hey, what do you think of this? Is this a good deal? It's like four hundred thousand for like an acre and a, with yeah. like a trailer on it. I'm like, if you bought this eighteen months ago, it would cost you eighty thousand yeah. dollars. It's crazy. <laughs> this podcast is brought to you by Duration Molding and Millwork. I, I'm so the project that we're working on with Needham uh, in Needham with Steve Teak. Uh, we've been going back and forth with Duration about all of the moldings on that project, and they're making some curved stuff. Um, but one of the things I didn't think of when we had put that order in, I had basically talk to them about making all this V groove or shiplap board for us for the outside. Yeah. We have all these like accent uh, areas on the house and cause a, bu a, a bunch of it is brick as well. A bunch of it's well, yeah, a good portion of it's brick, but there's like vertical uh, like shiplap. Yeah. And I was thinking, Hey, we'll have to cut it in. You know, I need this many nine foot or 10 foot boards. And they came back and they were like, Hey, can we just send these in 16s and you just cut them? I'm like, that's a lot of waste. He's like, no, we'll tongue and groove the ends, and you you'll you'll glue it, and you'll never know. Yeah, I'm like I didn't think of that because I'm thinking like all oh, this stuff's going to expand and contract. It's not. Yeah, like so I can basically do this whole shiplap wall and 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 not and reduce the waste because we have that that tongue and groove joint, and we're going to give it a quick forty grit sand, you know, so it, it matches, and then we paint it, and you'll never know that there's a field. It's like no seams at all. Yeah, and it's like that's one of the nice things about it. It's like obviously this is recycled material, but the fact that I can reduce my, you know, my waste is, is huge. And I know that you know we talked about it with them. Is like they're they're reducing their their waste and manufacturing it because they're cre basically creating you know dust that you know or they're taking dust, creating this product, and they're essentially reducing that amount of uh, byproduct. Yeah, I mean, I, even for them to make nine feet, I'm sure that their machinery is set up to be pumping out stuff at 16 feet. So it's yeah. like waste on your end or waste on their end. Right. So to come up with a, a solution to be able to make that field joint and not have any waste um, and ship the same amount of product is super smart. Yeah, and if you guys want to check out uh, some of those field joints, they have some photos on their Instagram uh, as well as their website, durationmillwork.com. This podcast is brought to you by Rockwool, high-performance, fire-resistant, soundproof, stonewall insulation for your interior and exterior walls, not only helping you overachieve local codes and building standards, but getting ahead of future codes. That uh, exterior was a little squeaky. Did you hear that? In my voice? or Yeah, it was like, exterior. <laughs> exterior. You know? I, I have no idea why. <laughs> I, don't mean, I don't mean to break your uh, train of thought. No, it's it's quite okay. Um, I You guys... I would advise you guys to join the R class program. Uh, they just gave Tyler. I don't know if you saw it, but they just gave away an entire house worth of insulation to someone that entered into it. They were an R. I believe they joined the R class and they entered the sweepstakes to get an entire house donated of rock wool. Um, which I mean, that's that's pretty epic. That's a pretty big giveaway. <laughs> that's a very big giveaway. Very big number. I don't, I don't have any inside information as to whether or not they'll do it again, but if you join the R-Class program, you get that premium partnership. Um, you're going to, you're going to join a community for, of, you know, with those that take great pride in their craft and always looking to learn, but you're going to learn about better materials. You're going to learn about installation techniques. You're also going to have access to them from a technical perspective when you're working on a part particular job like ours, we've brought them jobs that, you know, the the architect is designed to use different insulation, brought them the drawings, and they've helped us work through how to supplement or replace with uh, a mineral product in their in, in the entire home, uh, which is which is awesome. See, the nice thing about that too, that I've seen you bury that under grade, 
So that person, even if they don't have an entire house that they need rock bowl for, they can just save that until they're ready because nothing's going to happen, you know? I, I thought you were going to say they can bury it in their backyard. And that, or they there. could just keep it out back and just like, it's not, you know, you have normal fiberglass insulation. That stuff's oh, going to be trash with rock bowl. You can just save it till you're ready. Yeah, if you guys want to join that program, head over to rockwell.com slash R class. This podcast is brought to you by Upstate Merch. Over 12 years, Upstate Merch prides themselves on only using the best materials and American-made tools to get your job done. They're printing up some material shirts for us right now. They just shipped us some samples for some new NS, the 2022 collection. Uh, I'm making that sound. Yeah, like you're a, like a you're like a uh, yeah, you're like a um, a uh, like clothing Hilfiger, company. You know? Yeah. The 2022 collection. <laughs> 2022 collection. I'm pretty sure you're behind if your 2022 collection. You're unless absolutely it, what is absolutely right. <laughs> is it maybe it's a fall collection? Tyler, you, I am notorious for ordering my team swag in the wrong season. I will get them sweatshirts right now, but then they're like, "But we need t-shirts." I'm like, "I'm working on those." And then <laughs> the t-shirts will come in November. The funny thing is, though, like Rachel's in that for design and they're like years and seasons ahead wild um so you're way 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 behind well either way upstate's gonna help us with our our 2022 collection here um but they are highly trained staff graphic design team they can help you through that entire process whether it is design and printing or just printing uh, so if you're looking for embroidered hats giveaway shirts safety wear polos hoodies whatever you're looking for top quality garments uh, they have you covered. And if you guys want, you can head over to upstatemerch.com and email them at print at upstatemerch.com. And what do they get if they mention the Modern Craftsman? 10% off their first order. Boom. That's a decent amount. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're ordering the entire 2022. Nobody gives 10% off anything anymore. I created a second, another email to see if I could get 10% off. Yeah. It's my first didn't, order today. Didn't, didn't work. <laughs> Don't, no? I was like, no can do, man. Uh, I was like, fair he's enough. on to you. Yeah, he's definitely on to me. Nicole at NS Builders. You, you now are 50,000 times wealthier than you, when you were, uh, when you bought the yeah, house. I'm not but, rich, but I'm just saying it's just like no, funny how the bank would assume that I had money then and they, they totally. now they think I don't. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally get that. And, and, I, and I understand it was like an exaggeration, but your your whole background like there's so many different parts of it um you know being in school for visual arts and and the toys and 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 shows like what what has what has allowed you to you know whether it's fifty thousand times or, or a different number but what has really allowed you to to acquire that wealth um you know what's funny i i was always basically there was a time when i had money in the bank before I owned a house. Mm. And prior to that, I didn't have much expenses. I never got married. I never had a traditional family, so I never had children. And so all my money just went back into my investing in myself, you know, buying machines and equipment and occasionally, you know, feeding my hobby of liking old cars, occasionally trucks, occasionally Cadillacs. Um, and as the years went on, um, I bought a house and then when I bought a house, so I had money in the bank, then I bought a house and then I had no money in the bank because, you know, you, you think you're going to go to mortgage and you're going to go to signing and closing and you get this and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, we need to check for that. You need to check for that. You need to check for, you know, Indian burial title rights and this and that. <laughs> and then seriously, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, oh, cool. Oh, wow. Oh, oh yeah. By the way, uh, you know, your heating system broke. That's two thousand dollars. Oh, oh, okay. I happen to have that. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, oh, your, your, uh, your septic system, the pipe collapsed like, what kind of septic i don't even know what kind of septic system i have oh yeah that's seven thousand dollars to rip up your entire backyard and fix that and so shortly after buying the house i basically went down to paycheck to paycheck but i knew i was you know house wealthy or what you say house poor mm -hmm. and uh and at the time i was doing tv shows occasionally but none of them ever turned into like a huge payoff they were always just i would almost lose money each time because you'd have to put everything you were developing on hold to go and do a television show yeah. And you say, okay, this is going to be the one. And then it's not the one. And then you go back to trying to pick up the pieces that you left, you know, 18 months before. And um, then when I started, oh, I was with Taylor for about a year when she's like, you know, I had just done a show called Dirty Money. And mm -hmm. I was, uh, 
it was a show at Discovery Channel, and it was us picking garbage and redoing it and selling things at the flea market that we found in the garbage. It was a fun show. We, we had a great time. We did it in my shop in New York, and uh, the show came and went so fast. They didn't do another season pickup, you know, another disappointing adventure. And uh, then uh, my girlfriend says, why don't you just do this stuff on YouTube? You know, you're always hustling up these videos to try and sell to production companies. Why don't you just make a video every couple of weeks and put it on YouTube? And I started doing that. And then it took a few years. I mean, I'm at it now for about 11 or 12 years, but it took a few years. And I started to like have a little bit of extra money and then a little bit of extra money. And then I went from, you know, building out bar room tables and you know, building out. I worked for this one restaurant corporation and they would call me and they'd be like, okay, we need 13 tables by Sunday. Can you do that? We have a giant party coming in. We need like 13 tabletops. So I'm like, uh, all right. And yeah. you know, they'd give me a, they, they'd always say, give me three prices. They say, give us a check, uh, cash, and then pay up front, full pay up front. Give us those three. <laughs> and I would always just say, give me all the money up front. They'd be like, okay, right. cool. Come pick up the money and let us know when you can drop the tables off. You know, they were always, they were a cash business, so they always had money. They owned like 10 bars in Manhattan. So that was, um, that was kind of what I was doing most of the time. And then occasionally I would turn some of their projects into YouTube videos. And mm -hmm. slowly the projects... But the YouTube videos just became me doing things for myself because I had to do an ad for Audible or I had to do an ad for this. And you know, it was a really slow, gradual change where all of a sudden I'm getting five and ten thousand dollar checks for just a day's work where I would yeah. that would be, you know, three weeks worth of work for a five or a ten thousand dollar payday. But so I wanna to get to the YouTube, but what about before that? Like you, you started a toy design company, is that right? Mm -hmm. So as um, right when I left the School of Visual Arts, I began, I met a teacher there who got me in the toy business and he was sort of my first toy business client. He kept having me come in and develop his product ideas. And then he was allowing me to meet people, his connections. He introduced me to several people. He's always, he's a big mentor of mine. His name is Mark Seta Ducati. So Mark got me in the toy business and then I pulled my brother into it. And my brother got very interested in the toy business and he opened up lots of doors, lots of connections, and we were pitching our, our own ideas at the same time as developing other people's ideas. Mm -hmm. So we would basically take a draw, not a draw, but like, what do you call that? Like when you have a retainer, that's what it was. Mm -hmm. We would take a retainer from several toy companies, like we'd take 5,000 a month from them and 2,000 a month from them, and, you know, just do various tasks that they would need as outside development people. And that's that was what we basically started doing. And then at the same time, we were still trying to, catch a wave with any one of our own products and developing our own products. And with all of our connections, we were having meetings right away saying, you know, oh, we're working on your product, but would you be interested in this mm -hmm. proprietary idea? And occasionally we got things through, you know, nothing that we had the one thing called gurgling guts, which made us a lot of money at the time. Say, I, that, that then I bought a, a house lot. and yeah. I went broke. <laughs> <laughs> what? I, what did you want to be? Uh, you, you know, you went to school for visual arts, graduated. Um, yeah. and, but like, what, what were you kind of thinking you wanted to be? It wasn't probably a toy. Designer. You know, it's funny. I never, I never thought I'd be a, a, a celebrity maker, so to speak. I never, ever anticipated ever being on television. It was never in the cards. I just wanted a successful product. I, you know, I, m was inspired by so many of these guys I knew in the toy business. You see these guys, they're just living a casual, leisurely life with no real job, but they invented, you know, this gizmo that makes them a million dollars a year, or they invented that gizmo, you know. Uh, the lollipop, uh, the spin pop, you know, classic story. Those guys, there was a couple of people that weren't even in the toy business came up with the idea of a spin pop, and then that company made millions of dollars. So, um they were was, collecting royalties on top the, of royalties. Was the appeal in, in building a, success, a successful product the ability to have freedom to go then be in your shop and just kind of yeah. do whatever you want? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I ultimately built the life that I always had dreamed of, of just me. Just I mean, I'm always interested in, in tools. So yeah. it's always been a draw for me. Like it, it, you know, I see guys get successful and they buy. Oh, my God. I just got a Mike Pence moment, a fly landed on my face. Um, <laughs> you know, like uh, I always wanted just to, to play as a big 
to, you know, with big toys, expensive toys. I, I was never into like Lamborghinis or Ferraris, those type of toys. But when I was able to have the money to buy a Bridgeport mm. and pay for somebody to move it, I was like, whoa, now I'm, now I'm macking. I could, I could buy a Bridgeport for $400 cash and then I could pay a guy $1,000 to move it. I'm like, yeah, nah, now I'm macking. You know, like to me, that was success as I began to develop more and more um, abilities to buy a welder. I remember going, uh, the fly now is on my computer screen. I remember going and buying a, you know, laying down a credit card to buy my Lincoln Precision 225 TIG, knowing that, you know, I was setting myself back a little bit, but this is all for the greater good of just developing my, my tool, my tool vocabulary and my, my ability to make anything at any time. You know, but I, I guess the ultimate goal was to just never be limited. You know, you see guys and they just do stuff out of wood. They go, boy, one day I want to learn how to weld. Like I never, ever, I would always say one day I'm going to weld with freedom as opposed to weld with like a stick welder because that was $100 used on Craigslist. You know, I wanted to TIG weld. I wanted to MIG weld. I want to have a plasma cutter. I want to, you know, all these things I wanted. And, and I, I started to begin to see YouTube as a means to get all those things. And, uh, you know, there was a short moment in time where many YouTubers were upset with me because I would take the tools and I wouldn't care about the pay because people are like, you're setting a bad example for us because we want the tools and we want to get paid because yeah. I know I can get the tool and make a ton of money through some of my commercial contacts. Like, you know, my bullet bourbon contacts, you know, I could make signs. Somebody gives me a free CNC machine. I will, of course, make content for them on their CNC machine. But at the same time, I'm turning around charging thousands of dollars for things I'm making on the CNC machine to my clients that I've already had since YouTube started. You know, so I would always say, like, I would basically I still offer the deal to tool companies. I'm like, if you want to park one of your products in my shop, it'll get full on exposure in my videos. I'm not going to pay for it. And you don't have to pay me. Just drop the product off, and I'll use it. And they're like, a lot of people take that deal. You said that a lot of this developed when you were a kid, just like the want to build stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah I always did. I mean, ever since I was a little kid, my dad used to call me the creation kid. So, ever since I was a little boy, I was always just hot gluing his scraps together, and he taught me how to use the bandsaw and the, and the scroll saw when I was a little kid. So I'd always cut out silhouettes of things. And then even as, into, as we got into elementary school, my dad would encourage me and my brothers to make nameplates for the other students. So we would cut out names for other kids. My dad taught us to charge them for 25 cents per letter. So Joe was 75 cents. And we, we'd come home with a little black book. And we'd, I remember like crossing out the people that paid. So I was in like elementary school when we were doing that. What did your dad do for a living? He was a New York City fireman. Okay. And a, and a carpenter. So I grew up with a wood shop in the basement of my house. Always. And the people that know me my whole life, they're like, your life hasn't changed at all. This is exactly what you did when you were 12, 13 years old. Your dad was into the, just have a little bit. Your dad was into the flea markets, right? I think I read that about Dirty Money. Yeah. Uh, and your dad had Yeah, growing friend. up my, our whole life, still like now, now that we're out of the winter, yeah. there's a great flea market up the road. And every Sunday morning, my, it's funny because my assistant, my new assistant, Rob, he's completely addicted to the flea market. Every Sunday he comes up and goes, he comes up, he lives far away. So he comes up for like blocks of time during the week. He'll come up for like four days a week, but he always makes sure that he's here on a Sunday to go to the flea market. That's awesome. But yeah, I still go to the flea market and I, I mostly, I always say I shop with my eyes, not with my wallet. Mostly every single thing I see at the flea market that intrigues me, I already have. If Even if it's a vintage hammer or an axe head or I just bought a, I just bought my second Halligan. If you know what a Halligan bar is, it's a fireman's crowbar, which is very expensive. Um, but I mostly go there to look for ideas. I'll like sneak a couple of pictures here and there of things that I will ultimately just build and be like, ah, you know, cause it's like, it's like getting slapped in the face unexpectedly with it. Like, Oh wow, look at that. I'm going to make that. And then that becomes my video where if I'm sitting here alone trying to, access yeah. all the memory bank in my head of like all the cool things I saw and trying to write down things that I want to make. I need to, I need some visual stimulation. So that's really mostly why I go to the flea market now. Wait, when did you get out of uh, making toys or designing toys? Like when, when was that transition? Uh, well, uh, what, what began to happen with the toy business, it, it, it started to kind of really, it, it began to lean heavily onto licensing. Whereas a guy like me who would come up with original inventions, they would be like, 
how, how does this fit into Barbie? How does this fit into that? How does it? And then I'd be like, you know what? Like, like, no one's willing to, everyone's just leaning on all these old brands. No one's willing to take a new brand on and make something of it. And so that became frustrating. And so then anytime somebody wanted my help in the toy business, whereas in the past, I would kind of do 50-50. Sometimes I would charge somebody if I knew the idea was kind of janky. Sometimes I would be willing to take like a 50% or, you know, I would take royalties and the royalties hardly ever paid off. And I got to a point where no matter who walked through the door, I would just charge them mm. and I would charge them heftily. And it was really just to get serious fee. And, and like any inventor that wanted me to help them develop their idea, I would charge them heftily, you know, whatever, thousand dollars a day development. And, you know, they'd say like, what can I get for 5,000? I'd say, I'll give you two prototypes and like one revision, like stuff, whatever, like whatever it would be. Mm -hmm. And I just began charging for my time instead of this investment in my time into their product. And maybe one day it'll pay off. It, it almost never, ever paid off except for the things I did for myself. And so I started charging for my physical time. And then around the same time, around 2007, right after I did a show called Hammered, Somebody watched me on Hammered, a local interior designer in New York, and began calling on me to do things interior stuff. So the Hammered TV show got me my interior design job, which, I mean, I just basically agreed to do more interior design work. Mm -hmm. So I was doing a little bit of toy development and a little bit of interior design work overlapping. And both of them, I was just, sometimes I was making a prototype, sometimes I was making a, a headboard for a bed. It was just yeah. like whatever it was. And those jobs began to overlap. And then I began to just do more interior design over the years. All the while still coming up with show ideas and trying to sell show ideas with my brother, John. Well, so you said that crazy, you, crazy. you never, you never <laughs> expected to be on a show. Like where, where did that even come from? Like why? You know, so like yeah, so 20 years ago. Yeah, so right. if you go to 20 years ago, 2002, my brother John reached out to me. Who, my brother John, starting in 93, started doing stand-up comedy. By 98, he sold a television show to UPN that was on the air. Very briefly, it was a show called Duresta. It was about him as a transit cop. It didn't do well. It, it, it aired the same exact season. His very first episode aired the same night as the very first episode of King of Queens. And so King of Queens won that race. And my brother's show floundered. My, by his own admission, the show wasn't really well written. He wasn't in charge of the writing. He, it was just based on his comedy, and he, w he wasn't allowed to be in the writing room. I'm not saying it would have been better or worse whether he was involved, but it was just disheartening that the show had his name on it, and he was not a, given a writer's credit. But that's Hollywood. you know. It could be really tough sometimes. And so long story short, um, John was out in Hollywood for a while, got a couple of movies, did a movie with De Niro, Sandra Bullock, and uh, Matthew McConaughey. He got a couple of really big credits. And then 9-11 happened, and then everything kind of stopped short. And he came up with this idea to pick garbage and make it into stuff in 2002. And he called me. I was dabbling with video editing at the time because Final Cut Pro had just come out. And he said, would you be interested in coming out here and shooting a pilot with me? So I went out there and I shot a pilot of his idea of him picking garbage. And I was behind the camera the entire time. And I edited up a seven-minute video, and his manager, a guy named Barry Katz, who's actually very, uh, he's got a great podcast about the television industry called Industry Standard. And Barry's a, he's a great, funny, light, lovable guy, and in the, in the, we're still in touch. So John showed the tape to Barry, and Barry said, all right, l let me go show this around. And he got interest at a, a small production company called Fox Alternative, I think it was called. It's out of business now, but... They were working directly with Fox and FX Network. And we got called into a meeting from this tape that I made in 2002. And a, a guy named David met with us, and he looked at the tape, and he said, I'm, I think this is really funny. I've watched it several times, and now here we are in the room. And he goes, so give me, give me the two-minute pitch. And John said, well, I find garbage, and I make it into stuff. And he looks at me, and he goes, oh, I find garbage, and make it into stuff, and, and you know, the whole time I'm being funny. And he looks at me, he goes, why are you in this meeting? I said, well, I'm the, I'd be the technical advisor behind the camera or behind the scenes. We'd find cool stuff, and I would tell John what we can creatively turn it into. And I would supervise those builds off camera. You know, we'd have John step in pretending like he's doing stuff. And he goes, well, why, why don't we do this? 
he like literally thought for like one minute and goes, why don't we do this? He goes, why don't you be the guy on camera that makes stuff? Do you have a problem with that? And I was like, no. And he looked at John, he goes, and you just be the host and you'd be funny. What do you think? And I was like, all right. He goes, I like the brother thing. He goes, let's just shoot a pilot, see where it goes. And then that was it. And so if you, there's a very funny podcast where Barry Katz interviews me and John together from a couple of years ago. And Barry remembers that moment. He was in the meeting and he kept, he kept hammering me. It's really funny. He kept hammering me going, now, when you made the pilot, you didn't think you were going to be in it. I said, no. He goes, now, when you, you and I, because he sat with me, he goes, when we edited it and you, and I, I revised the edits when I sat with you at that office in New York, he goes, you didn't want to be in the show. And I was like, nope. <laughs> it wasn't even it wasn't even on my radar to be in the show I just never ever anticipated anybody being interested in watching me and I never wasn't I was all wrapped up in the production aspect of it and the creativity of making the film and you know doing the film work and the filmmaking aspect of it so when that guy David looked at me and goes you want to be on camera making the stuff and you be the funny guy and I know never say no to an improv especially when you're in a Hollywood meeting and when he said you okay being on camera? I was wasn't gonna go. Nah, not it's not something I ever expected. You know, I didn't want to say that. I just immediately said sure, because that just makes you seem like a you know a go with the flow kind of guy. And anyway, so we ended up shooting seven episodes of there was that called Trash to Cash with John Deresta. And during that show, that show aired. It didn't make a huge splash, but we slowly developed a small audience and. A lot of people in the audience were saying, writing us letters, and you know, the beginning of email for us was saying, "I really like when you did this. Could you show more of how you do that?" And and me and John sat down and said, "Why don't we do a show where we just show how we make stuff? It doesn't have to be out of the garbage. It doesn't have to. Well, let's just make stuff and be funny." Mm -hmm. And so we shot a pilot, which is actually on my YouTube channel, an early pilot called "Making It with John and Jimmy." And so we had that name, Making It With John and Jimmy, and we sold that show to HGTV a few years later. So mm. that we went from 2002, now it's 2005. It's three years later, we were able to sell that show, Making It, to HGTV. And HGTV picked the show up and they changed the name with a small production company. They gave it to a production company to handle it and this, they changed the name to Hammered. And we shot 28 episodes of Hammered. So that was our second TV show. And so now me and my brother are sort of established as a duo. While we were working on that, we shot a pilot for uh, our own pilot for a thing called Lord of the Fleas. We shot that in 2006. I remember going and buying, again, like I like expensive toys. So I went and I bought a Panasonic video camera for $3,500 on a credit card. And the first thing we shot on that was a TV show idea called Lord of the Fleas, where we pick garbage and make it into stuff and sell it at the flea market. And that videotape had been bouncing around. YouTube developed, and I put all my TV show pictures on my YouTube channel that nobody ever saw. And uh, in 2010, I was having a meeting with a friend of mine that owns a production company. And he said, he goes, you have any TV show ideas? I said, actually, I do. I said, hey, look. I opened my YouTube channel on his computer, and I said, watch these few shows. These are some ideas I have. And then when I left, he called me a couple of hours later and said, you have a thing on here called lord of the fleas has anybody seen it i was like everybody has seen it five times i was like but i guarantee you that none of those people are still in their jobs anymore because i shot it four or five years earlier and he goes would you let me show it to discovery channel i said sure he showed it to discovery channel and we got a deal and we were shooting our first episode in uh, 2000 the summer of 2011. so how we shot 12 episodes of that show how were you able yeah. to just get on camera? Like, is it just a knack that you're able to do? Because to tell somebody, yeah, I'm fine with getting on camera and then having a camera in your face are two completely different things. You know, it's funny. I never, ever, I guess maybe I'm a little vain. It never was a thing for me. Like, I never, ever for any one minute was... Oh, I guess the big reason is this. This is the reason. Because I taught college classes, so... yeah. I stood in front of, you know, I taught college classes from 94 until 2017. So throughout all of this, I would yeah. teach a college course once a week for, you know, for the school year. I feel so like that's harder than being, being in, front of, in front of a camera. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I forgot. I've completely forgot that aspect of my life. I was always a college professor. You know, I wasn't a professor. I never got the like tenured or anything. But I worked at the New York City School of Visual Arts from 2000 and sorry, from 1993. I graduated in '90, and then a teacher invited me back to teach a course in '93. So I I was in front of an audience every day, you know, every week, and. I knew from hanging around with my brother from the same amount of time watching his stand-up comedy. And then I would go with him to stand-up comedy and I'd hang out with the likes of, you know, I can't say I'm friends with them, but I got to see up close and personal Dave Chappelle, Todd Barry, uh, Colin Quinn, I actually became a little friendly with Colin Quinn, uh, Patrice O'Neill, all these comedians from the 90s. I'd see them up close and personal because they go on even, you know, before or after my brother. And so I got to see all these guys and I got to develop, like I went to, so I went to more stand-up comedy than the average person does in five lifetimes because I lived in the East Village. I was always at all the comedy clubs because my brother was always going. And I developed a certain level of skill being able to handle an audience and, and not be afraid of bombing because of like the skills. I'm not a stand-up comedian, but there's a certain level of public speaking. There's a certain level of confidence you have to have. And that really helped me in my students, working with my students, like watching certain, just helping, watching the stand-up comedian and then trying to, like a dry sense of humor, bringing it to the students. I realized early on that, you know, the teachers that made me laugh were the ones I paid close attention to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The ones that didn't make me laugh lost my attention and you know, yeah. I had no Very interest in going back to the... Yeah, so I always liked the teachers that were kind of snarky and, and dry sense of New York City humor. And there was a lot of them, and there was some that were just absolutely horrible. And so my point is, is that I always knew that if I was silly, which is also, it comes natural to me, but if I was silly with the students, they'd pay closer attention to class, and we'd have more of a fun time. It would be more fun for me and more fun for them. Yeah, I think one of the key things so that you... So that's why I was able to just jump on camera, basically. I think. Yeah, and I think one of the key things that I, like kind of spoke to me is that it was teaching for you and I, like even the stuff that I do, if I film something that's educational, it's very natural when you're teaching something that you know, because it's not an act. But then when somebody yeah. like a product vendor exactly. wants you to pitch something, it's super awkward for me because it's like, I could talk about this product when I'm using it. But then like, if you want me to say that it has certain attributes, it's just very forced and not like I'm not an actor, but I don't have an well, issue yeah, getting you know, up and funny, kind of teaching. To that yeah, to that point, whenever I do like a YouTube read, it's funny because I listen to Bill Burr all the time and he just reads exactly what they give him. He, he doesn't, you know, he'll make it funny because he's being, you know, he's being more self-deprecating than anything because he can't read. But when I do a read, if it's something that I've either never used or like some financial product I just agreed to promote, I will read exactly what they want. I, just yeah. tell me exactly what you want me to say. And I'll read it exactly. I'll try to be funny or I'll try to be snarky, but I'll just get, but if it's something I know well, like a product that's used in the shop, I don't even have to talk about it. I just use it and they love it. But when it's like some script read, I'm like, just tell me exactly what you want me to say. And I'll say it exactly. I'll try and give you a quality read. You know, who's and you know, thank that. God for jump cuts. I just yeah. jump cut through everything. Nobody seems to care. Jump cuts are, are the best, but, um, I can I can definitely do the read if I have something in front of me and reading reading it, but when someone gives me a line and then says, "All right, now say that," I can't do it. And I had <laughs> done I had done something with this old house years ago, and it was that they kept giving me this line. I just kept screwing it up, and I'll never forget one <laughs> of them. One of them was like, I forget who how it came up, but they're like, "You know who's really good at this is Kevin O'Connor." You can tell him one oh, yeah, yeah. A, an entire paragraph, and he'll he'll spit it right back. And I'm like, that's, that's I'm just fun. not. It's I'm the same with Tyler. It's it has to be something I'm comfortable with, and that I'm act like it's something that I can I can speak to because I do it all the time. But I, I would have the same question Tyler just asked you about camera, but with students. So how? Let's ask the same question. How did you decide to get into teaching, and feel comfortable enough to stand in front of what I would assume is probably 20, 30, 40, 50 kids? Uh, about 25 on the average, 25 kids on the average, and they were about 20 to 25 year olds. And I, I you guess know, college, it was art college, so you. Yeah, I guess college. Most of them want like want to be there or are at least interested. Yeah. But yeah, for the most part, 
for the most part, you know, like you have a lot of kids that just, you know, the, the parents obviously paid their way, but you have a lot of kids in, it was like 50, 50, they're there just kind of passing time. And so I try to make it as fun and as interesting as possible for them. But then you have the kids that were like me that really seek out things that, that interest them. And then they're like, you know what, this is costing me like $90 an hour. I might as well just make the best of it while I'm here and really be engaged. You know, every college class I ever took and every class I ever do take any meeting I go to anything, I sit directly right in the front so I could hear everything. I'm like, I have nothing to do except be here for an hour. Let me get the best of it. Let me get the most of it. So every class I've ever been in, I always sit right in the front. And so there were kids that I recognized my same same uh you know spirit in mm. the kids and the students and those are the ones that you know excelled the most in those classes but in general the i was invited because when i was a student i was always very interested in the, what i pursued so i knew everything about it this was obviously before google so there were certain shops in new york city that had mold making material or certain type of paint shops or art shops and I would go there and I would just pick the salesman's ear and get to know them there and become friendly with them and go back a lot and I'd ask people who knew more than me just like you ask Google you ask Google because they know more than you mm -hmm. and I became a little bit of an authority on a lot of things in in my peer group because I just took the time to go and learn these things and it's it's a set, you know a lot of people have this I'm in school when I'm out of school I'm doing something else I'm either you know hanging out with my friends or watching sports I was always in the mind of wanting to work and learn. I don't know why, I just always was. And so I became a little bit more uh, skilled faster. So when it, my teacher saw what I was doing right after school, which was involved in the toy business, he said, would you be interested in coming back and teaching? And I immediately said, well, that would be a great opportunity. But the very first day of my very first class, I stood in front of 25 kids staring at me going, okay, what do you have to tell us? And I was like, holy shit, why did I agree to do this? <laughs> I was like my very first fear of public speaking like, came to me. I was like, okay, I'm going to uh, show you guys how to make things. And we're going to do it. And I was like, okay, it's the first day of class. You guys can leave early. And it was like 15 minutes after <laughs> class started. Do you seem and, like the type of person uh, yeah. who doesn't need to go to college because you almost want to dig for those answers and figure out how to do shit on your own anyway? It's funny because I, I, right after college, I began... I never had like a real full-time job with anybody, but I always did all these part-time agreements. So I would like devote time you know, per month to this company or that company. So I was working for a company called Natural Science Industries and they were the first company that sponsored me and sent me to Hong Kong. So in 92 was my first trip to Hong Kong for them, which I mean, they opened up so many doors for me as well. They, they, I was very grateful for my relationship with them, NSI, Natural Science Industries. And they, uh, they've morphed into a company called Horizon Group. So if you see like craft products at, at Walmart called Horizon Group, I worked for them in the early 90s. And uh, that they would send me to Hong Kong. But I remember I was working with them for like a year. And the main guy I always worked with was a guy named Andy. And uh, I said, yeah, I might go back to teach uh, at the school I went to. He goes, you, you went to school? I go, yeah. He goes, you went to college? I go, yeah. He goes, I just thought you were the kind of guy that just knows how to do all this shit. <laughs> I was like, no, I went to, I go, he goes, you have a degree? And I had been working with him for like nearly two years at that point. He goes, I just thought you were just a guy that just knew how to figure things out. That's why I liked you so much. <laughs> because I didn't know you went, I go, well, to be perfectly honest, I, I said I learned more about composition and color from school than, than the mechanics and the know-how and the intuitive figuring things out. That's kind of always how, how I always was. The most I got out of school was just developing friendships and relationships, which yeah. recently my nephew, who's, just he's entering his second year of college in Indiana. He's going to business school in Indiana. But prior to that, like leaving high school a couple of years ago and him deciding what he really wanted to do with life, he was like, I don't, I don't want to go to college. I, I could figure it all out. And I said to him, I go, look, go to college because the most important thing about college is not what you learn. It's the people you come up with. I said, you are going to come up with the next uh, you know, the, the, I can't even think of the, who's the guy that owns Tesla. What's his name? Elon Musk. I said, you're going to go to school with the next Elon. You're going to go to school with the next, this one and that one. And I named, he's, he has several people he looks up to and, and it's all these entrepreneurs. So I said, you're going to go to school with all those guys. You're going to be one of those guys. And then as you guys develop through life, cause he was going to a business school. Uh, I was like, as you guys each develop you, you, all these guys, I know that are deep, entrenched in business they always lean on their college alumni the most or at least quite a bit you know any like my business partner 
He went to Amherst, and he's like, he's a good guy. He's from Amherst. He's a good guy. He's at Amherst. You know, like I said, that's going to be the most important thing in your quiver going forward is is the relationships you develop when you're in college because, mm. you know, these guys will die for you, and you'll die for them because you have this weird uh, commonality. It's really uh, – I think that I heard that from a lot of people going into college and it was almost just like in one ear out the other. You don't understand it until it's already way past you. Yeah. Like when you're in college, yeah. it, you it, you can't make sense of them. Somebody tells you something when you're 18 years old, 19 years old, and you like, my parents were like, just go enjoy college. This is your last chance. Like, and I just, what I didn't want to hear it. I didn't want to be there. And looking back on it, I'm like, I should have just gone and enjoyed college instead of working my way through it. <laughs> and like, I should have developed those relationships, but I was just ready for the next thing. It's so hard to actually like take that and do something with it when you're 18 years old. You yeah. can't think yeah, about yeah, the yeah. relationships that are like 20 years down the road. Yep. No, it's true. You know, Unfortunately, was... my nephew got the, my nephew seems to be gathering, like my, my nephew's heroes are like, Logan Paul and you know that whole crew which I mean it, it sounds silly but those guys obviously are sh extremely successful at just right. doing whatever the hell they want they've figured out how to network it into multi-million dollars of, of a career and I actually enjoy watching those guys I think they're really funny so my nephew is like seeing what they're doing and he kind of has like his little gaggle of jackass inspired guys they do stupid stuff with uh you know jumping off of roofs and doing stuff like that at the same time he's looking to sell t-shirts and looking for little angles here and there and he's got a podcast he's got a blog is this aiden the rest is my nephew's name and you could find him online but he's he's he'll figure it out he'll definitely figure it out he's very very motivated i i, I think you you're uh, talking about something interesting too because i've always you know i've always looked back at college and everyone's like, oh, do you regret going? And I'm like, no, I don't regret going. Obviously, I, you know, I'm, I am where I am for certain reasons. And I can tie a lot of it back to, you know, school, the job I got out of school, the job that led me to meeting my wife, all of that. But I think what you just were talking about and, and something I heard on a podcast uh, just last week was that oftentimes if, you know, there's two schools of thought. You can go to school and you can train and get a degree in something that you're truly interested in and then build a career on that. Or you can go to school and, and be part of a network of people that ultimately you go on to to build your network and and, and build something. You know, whether like and, and be surrounded by people that are that are, you know, investing in themselves and investing ultimately in you. And, you know, I think that Tyler, I'm with you where it's like I went to school and I just worked my way through it. And I worked and I worked constantly in between class and I didn't I never really enjoyed school. I didn't I built a handful of relationships, but it wasn't like I was there trying to figure out, all right, who who can I be networking with? Who can I be, you know, uh, like thinking that who's going to be the most successful person? And I should be, you know, talking to them about their plan and how they're going to build a, a great life for them. Because ultimately I was also in the class where it's like I'm just doing this to get the degree and I, yeah. I, I don't actually feel like I'm learning anything. See, this is the tough part about going, you know, I went for construction management and it was a commercial based program. And I, like the network of people in that major was so small that I like I don't have anyone from my past from that network that like really has anything to do with what I do today. I don't know if there's like a more if you know, if you go for a more general major or a business major and then it, it's almost doesn't matter what you get into, you have those industry connections but it's like i went you know all my professors were working in the city they're consultants they're commercial construction project managers and at this point in residential it's like i can't really turn to any of them for the network or the help at this point it was almost too specialized well you know what my network is now which is fantastic if i need a problem with anything or if i need like if I need a dog groomer in the area, I just go on Instagram. It's like, anybody know a good dog groomer? Yeah. And then, you know, they'll say, you know, anybody, is there going to be anybody like at this time here or there to help me carry something? They're like, oh, like five people show up. <laughs> so it's social media has just been amazing. I made a joke a couple months ago. Well, now it's a couple of years ago. I was in, I was in the city. I was at a, I was having dinner with a friend of mine 
And I was like, anybody want to join us? Come to Wohop and Chinatown. And like this dude showed up and I've been friends with this dude ever since. He's like, I saw your Instagram. He's like, I happen to be in bio. I'll come hang out with you guys have dinner. And you know, just, it's just, it's been great. It's just, it's, it is great. It's just, it's, it's such a it great is. change from when we were kids. And it's almost like you obviously have the TV shows and everything else, but like you, your entire life leading up to this, you were trying to find projects and jobs that would support the lifestyle that you really wanted with the mindset yeah. that that lifestyle would not provide you with the necessary income to live life. And now like because of social, because of YouTube and everything else, you're mm -hmm. actually able to do what <laughs> you wanted to do and get paid for it, which like I, 20 years yeah, ago, I you mean, were probably like, like that's it, an impossibility. Well, you know, I like I'm thinking now, I, I didn't think of this answer before, but like my people that inspired me when I was in art school was like Philippe Stark, who just designed anything. Uh, you know, Raymond Lowy, who's from the 50s, who designed anything he wanted. Just like he designed car fins off of, you know, he designed the, uh, the Studebaker, I think it's called the Hawk, the Studebaker. Um, you know, he did the logo for Lucky Strike Cigarettes, Raymond Lowy. These are the guys I studied. And Philippe Stark, who, you know, look up Philippe Stark if you don't know who he is. He's an incredible, just designed anything. And and then seeing like the childlike aspect of someone like Picasso who's jumping around with no shoes on at 65 years old, you know, going out with young women and smoking cigarettes and making art. And, you know, uh, Andy Warhol, who did whatever the hell he wanted, playing with his friends, just shooting films and silk screening and obviously making a living at it. You know, these type of lifestyles are the type of lifestyles I was inspired by. Um, I got uh, I remembered seeing and I'm, I hope I'm saying his name correctly. I remember walking through a museum and seeing uh, uh, Richard Chamberlain, who I think ultimately was like a bad alcoholic artist, but Richard Chamberlain was an artist who would crush cars. Mm. He would take cars and crush them and just, and that became art, you know, like that bailed 1950s Ford Deluxe to him was art. It wasn't, it wasn't junk. And so he like literally like put it in a spotlight and he, got apparently got his own baler and crusher and started curating these car crushes and you know he's guys like him and then um you know so these type of all these artists inspired me to basically think like what is it going to be for me that I can create that's art that people will just buy because I made it and ultimately that became my videos mm. because I could make a video about me making a chair or me making a you know fixing my backhoe and to me, the filmmaking aspect of it is a certain type of art. And, uh, you know, thankfully, I'm attributed with the idea of sped up, no talk, just sound videos. It wasn't something I set out to do. It just what began to happen was fans would write me and say, I love your video style. No conversation. You know, I'd get also translated Google translated messages that say I'm in Brazil and I, I don't speak English, but I love the fact that you don't have any conversation in your video. I could watch it without the sound on and I get more and more. So and then, and then what would happen is somebody who would compliment my video style would write to me six months later and say, you know what? You inspired me to make my first video and it looks exactly like yours. So I'm gonna call it the Resta Inspired if that's okay with you. And I would always say, of course, that's fine. And uh, so if you Google the Resta Inspired, you'll see lots and lots of YouTube videos where people copy my style and it's perfectly okay with me if they put my name in the title. People would always say to me, oh, he's just using your name to get views. I'm like, that's okay because his audience might not know who I am and they're going to go Google me and say, so it's just another little way of being like a tick out there and just getting under people's skin. Go I, I want to talk about the, the car crushing, um, Chamberlain, because I, I see, I follow this other guy. I think his name's like Kalen Schwab or something like that. And he does this art where he paints these large canvases and he puts them on a carousel and he and he fills this like bucket of paint of all different colors and he'll spin the canvas on this thing he made with a bike chain something that literally I look at it and I'm like the rest of right. build that and and then he spins <laughs> the art across and it's this like this swirl of color and I I I've, I've been following him for years now and there's so many people that that comment like this is fake art this is bullshit like you do the same thing over and over and i remember there was a point in time where he like he he had like a mental breakdown on social media and he he left he was like i can't deal with the, the amount of hate 
And since then, he's come back and really been strong and actually is, embraces it. He prints out a lot of the tweets, and then he'll, like, put his art on top of it. And he sells them for <laughs> anywhere from ten or to maybe $100,000. And I love wow. it. I, I think it's so – for me, like, I look at that, I'm like, hell yeah. Like, that's the way you're supposed to approach this. And, and the car crushing thing is so interesting to me it, because it's – it's the interpretation, right? Where it's like, I look at cars crushed all the time on the back of a truck, all bailed up, and they're they're going to overseas somewhere to be turned into to metal. But this guy decided that, hey, it's art. And you had said something interesting where it's like, you wanted to find a way to be able to create something that people would buy. So I guess my question is, when it comes to something like, hey, this crushed car, I'm going to determine it's art. Where does the... Where does that like monetary value come from? Like, where, like, how are we like, how, and is it attributed by you or is it something that someone else, I, I think about also, um, Trent Presler, who I know, you know, with the canoe Sure. and he, sure, you know, sure, sure. And his whole story about, I don't, I can't sell the canoe. I don't know what it would be. And then someone told him to charge a hundred thousand dollars and he jokingly said it. And then yeah. the next thing you know, he's got three orders for a hundred thousand dollar canoes. Where does that monetary yeah. value come when it when it is so deep rooted in what I'm gonna what we're calling art? You know, it, it's a, it's a level of perception. By the way, I just looked. There's John Chamberlain. I always confuse his name. That's why I knew I was saying his name wrong. It's John Chamberlain, the artist, and he was inspired by crushed cars and he would take he would, car parts bent up. Anyway, um, the idea of what to charge really just gets down to, you know, I worked with I worked with an interior designer. And he said, he said to me, this is going back 30 years ago. He's like, well, 25 years ago, he's like, you're worth 500 a day. Don't let anybody tell you anything different. And I was like, oh, wow, that's interesting. Um, I never thought of it like that. He goes, no, that's what you're worth. He goes, because you, you show up, you have ideas, you do this. So when I was getting into interior design, I started people would say, how much is that going to be? I was like, well, that's about three days worth of work. I'd say, you know, with materials, $2,000, $2,500. Like, well, that's a lot. How do you determine that price? I said, because I charge 500 a day. And that's three days worth of work plus materials is that much. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, that, well, that makes sense. And so I began to develop the confidence to just say that's that much money. But then I also know, for instance, when I'm selling my ice picks, it's really just a, a perceived value and it's handmade by me. Mm -hmm. So there's another part of the perceived value. So when I started making my ice picks and I pre-sold my first 100 to see if anybody was interested, they sold out immediately. I put them up for $65 each, I think it was. And I had people write, like, who are you to charge $65 for? I was like, don't buy it. Right. That's go make I your own. That's I, it's like, what? Like, just like, ignore it. It's, just go make your you. own. It doesn't matter. Yeah. And I sold out immediately. But, you know, still I have people like, like I because I've been selling them now for about seven years. And I have people still, they're like, I can't believe you're asking $65 for an ice pick. I'm like, then don't buy it. I've sold 10,000 of them and don't buy it. I don't care. I guess I'm so removed from that mentality. I, th I just looked him up. Uh, there's another one, Hunt Sloanum. And he, he's famous for painting like the one stroke bunnies on, on canvas. Oh, okay. And I mean, he'll, he'll paint one bunny on a, a, on a small canvas and it will sell for $5,000. And it's like you <laughs> see people Good comment. Yeah, you see people comment like, I could paint that. It's like, but you don't. Like but right. that's that's the thing. It's like go ahead, go be the Hans uh I'm saying his name wrong, but go be the in, the the impersonator and see like what you can do. It's it's I, just I, so I, you know, I, that people combat it. It's like I was lucky enough to hang out with a couple of uh, these surrealist artists. N nobody that ever made like a huge name, but some people know. I hung out with uh, a, a guy named Jeff Sheridan, who's a he was a famous magician in the 70s and the 80s. He's a, he was a big inspiration to me when it comes to inventing and just thinking about art. And uh, he said, you know, he, he inspired me. And one of the things he said was, it's, it's not, it's not the, the act. It's really more the intention behind the act. So it's mm -hmm. not the act of that person painting a bunny. It's the intention right. that led them to that. And that's, you know, you're not necessarily paying for the physical thing. Right. You're paying for, like, everything that led up to that. And I thought that was an interesting concept on that. It's... You know, and I think I want to talk about brand, like personal brand too. But just to kind of summarize or, or kind of add to what we're talking about, we, uh, my partner in the millwork company, Ken and I, 
we've been talking about building this table and you know we we reclaim some wood and i have this idea and i'm like i know what it looks like i know what i want it to be and i want to sell for eighty five thousand dollars and he's he's like what he's like it's it's like it's that's a ten thousand dollar table i'm like i know but i don't it's it's not because i'm greedy it's because i want to i I want that perceived value of that table it's not about the time it takes to build it i want it to be about the uh, what you just said it's like the intention of what we were trying to accomplish with, with mm-hmm. materials at hand and yeah. he thinks i'm i'm ludicrous and he's like people are gonna think you're you're an asshole i'm like so I, what whatever if it doesn't like, work it, it doesn't not, work who cares nothing yeah. gain nothing lost so you right. sell and, it for fifty thousand dollars or, or i never sell it and i just have a nice table and but when Dude. i do sell it it's like to them now that table has has proven to be valuable but so mm-hmm. where i was going like to to go back to branding like i think this is where you're going with the the video and obviously the tv show in youtube and now these ice picks you know you're relating that value to who you are who jimmy is Mm -hmm. your your personal brand and i guess thinking back to your first tv show to where you are today what like what has is that is that an active thought in your mind like who you are as a brand uh, well, yeah, I try to like there's certain things like when I want people to think of the rest, I want people to think of somebody that can do things that's not flagrant, that's not a flake. You know, so there are certain things like that. Like I, I always do what I say I'm going to do. And even if I start a project in the beginning of a year and then I never talk about it again, I'll bring it. I'll always my buddy, Derek, who's on the show with me, Derek always reminds me, he goes, I can't believe because you actually he goes, I watched you start. So you've been friends now for about six years. He goes. I watched you start things in my mind. I'm like, he's never going to finish that. And you always finish it. Like, for instance, I just put out a, you know, one of my best performing videos in recent time is a, I put out a video of me rebuilding the deck in the front of the house. And I just jumped into it, not thinking I'd film it. Then I was like, there's too much content here. So I don't have the very beginning of the video because I did not film the very beginning. But anyway, so I filmed and built the deck and, and it's and it's a good performing video, but uh, more importantly, the point is is that I started restoring the deck, and it's it's almost done. I didn't want to do that. I didn't. I mean, I'm not the type of carpenter that gets on his hands and knees and does framing. I don't. I mean, I can. I don't like doing it. I never liked doing it when I was doing it for money as a college student. But I'm. I'm I always tell people, like, oh, you're a carpenter. I was like, I build everything after the walls are sheet rocked. I said that's that's what I do. I said I don't. You know, I, I said, I don't install bathrooms and kitchens, but if you want something weird and special, hire me, I'll do that. And I said, I don't, and, and I also don't install anymore. I was like, if you want me to do something, if I can't drop it off, then I'm not going to build it. I don't have the time to stick around your property and leave my tools in your driveway for a couple of days. So that's not what I do. But, you know, I, I've been able to develop that luxury. It was, you know, there's a time when I'd say, I'll do anything. It doesn't matter what it is. Yeah, I'll do it. Absolutely. I don't care what it takes. I just, you know, right now I need, I don't have anything to do for the next two weeks and... I don't have any money coming in, so I'll do whatever you need. You want me to rip up? I remember doing. I took this job, and my friend's like, you really want to do that? I'm like, he's paying me a lot of money, and what else am I going to do? If I said no to that, I'd be doing nothing. You know, So it's a matter of what the opportunity. I rebuilt the bar, a floor in a bar, mm-hmm. and when I cut out all the rotted wood from like years of beer soaking into the floor, there was a whole other floor underneath it. They just built the floor on top of a floor. And I said to the guy, I'm like, you know, you could like make this whole room six inches shorter if you wanted to. You'd get more ceiling height. Uh, we ended up just patching that hole in the floor because he had no money to do that. But I hope you did something with anyway. the, the beer-soaked wood. So you asked me about my brand. I started rambling. But the idea is I just, you know, just the can-do attitude is really what I wanted the rest of the brand to stand for. Mm-hmm. Not flakiness. You know, mean what you say. And... I try, and also like a little bit of like an edgy cool, you know, with the knives, and now we sell the razor blades, and uh, we sell these, oh, we sell the razor blades, this one, it's got food on it, but we sell these razor blades now, it's like a big utility blade, uh, That's I a, say we, I'm talking about me and my business partner. You make those? I, we, I made the first hundred, but now we manufacture them in a factory. But and that's an actual blade? Rig- it's a real blade. It's te- it's a 420 stainless steel. It's it's actually quite sharp. And <laughs> as, as he as holds it with his face, you guys can't see this because it's a podcast. But it's like uh, yeah. six, what six inches long, and it looks it's like basically seven, like a utility knife blade. It's, it's, it's a utility, utility knife, knife blade, blade that you seven yeah that you would put in a stainless. It's the knife. size of a utility knife. It's seven and a half inches. That's. You that's need amazing. to make the knife for that. 
Yeah. A couple, a couple of fans have already made the knife. I've been selling these for about three years. And uh, I, I, I have those manufactured now. What does uh, that sell I, for? 50 bucks. And how much does it cost to make? I feel like I'm on Shark Tank, but I'm curious. Cheap. Cheap, yeah. <laughs> But I get like, them. Well, but they're, they're freaking cool. I'll, like, I, I, I want one of those. Well, I'll send you guys one. Sorry, hit the mic. Well, I'll but pay, I'll send no, you I'll guys. Pay, one of these. I'll pay the fifty dollars for it. that. That thing's cool as hell. Yeah, but with this, I the idea behind this was I be, I as a toy designer, a toy inventor. I if you could get just one object, one piece of material to be the cool thing, like a silly putty, for instance. It's just yeah. one thing. It's in a shell but silly putty itself is just one piece of a mechanism mm -hmm. uh you know a fixed blade is just a one piece of a mechanism so i always like a bottle opener is just a one piece fixed but I, I mean i'm not i don't like promoting the idea of the bottle opener but i've tried to come up with just the one thing that has no moving parts yeah my buddy jocko whatever jocko whatever is his youtube name jocko came up with this knife and the knife has moving parts, and the moving parts sometimes fall apart. And I know he was getting a lot of recalls. He had to like fix a lot of them, and he did a whole new round and sent them back out. And he had a lot, and it, because the moving parts in manufacturing didn't hold up the way he expected. And I was like, wouldn't it be nice to have a utility knife that had no moving parts? And that was inspired me to make this. <laughs> and I, I first made it as a piece of art, like functional art. And then yeah. I was like, let me make. So I handmade a bunch, and like. So the, the, to hand make them is a total pain in the butt. So right. I found a factory that makes kitchen knives and they make them for me now. Do, do, are you still on that hunt for that one product that just kind of sets you up? Like thinking yes. back about the toy business, like that, like whether Always. it's that blade or yeah. You know, slowly it's been the ice pick. I mean, we sell, sometimes we sell. I sell about I sell at least a hundred ice picks a month. I don't know what the math is. We sell about a hundred ice picks a month. That's, so that's six thousand dollars a month in ice picks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but I have to make them. And you know, lately I, my my sister Rob's been doing the the lion's share of the physical work. But the good thing about the ice pick is that it's it's constantly we're constantly figuring out better ways of making it. And because I can't find anybody else to make it, mm -hmm. I've went to factories and they don't want to do it. They they. <laughs> Either the numbers are too low or they're like, oh, I don't really know how to do this part. I'll do this part, but not this part. It's a stupid little dumb thing that, you know, people. We finally found a factory to make these in America. So a factory makes this handle with the blade on it. And then we cut the tubes and crimp the tubes and solder the rings on. And I just bought a, a die That's stamping machine to put the logo in. In the past, I've CNC'd the logo. I hand stamped it in. Now we actually have a, a machine that does it in a matter of seconds. We just like sit, you pull the trigger, pull the trigger, pull the trigger. So we finally got that figured out. So it's been lots and lots of development in the manufacturing of this. It's been fun. And then I'll do specialty ones. For instance, this one has a magnet in the handle. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'll just I'll set up the milling machine and I'll end drill fifty of them and glue magnets into them and sell those for a bigger price. Right. So trying to find that one product is that legacy financial security um like it, is it just what you want to do because it, it seems like you're you're in a good position now you're kind of doing what you want like what's the the goal for trying to find that one thing well i guess the goal is uh, financial security also you know i always have this like little ego ego maniacal idea of like somebody saying in 20 years after i'm dead Hand me the Duresta. You know, what is that going to be? What is that? Is it going to be the ice pick? Is it going to be this big knife? You know, after there's a, uh, after there's the, the world gets eliminated and then rebuilt in, you know, 2000 years from now, someone's going to be like, I'm um, good thing we have the Duresta. Whatever that is, I don't know what it is. Is it a hal? Like, for instance, I told you earlier in this conversation, it's like I bought it my second Haligon for $100. A Haligon is, is a fireman's crowbar. It's named after mm -hmm. Captain Haligon who thought of it. He's like, if I'm going to be ripping open doors and fires, I want the crowbar to have this, that, and that shape, and that shape. And so he had it manufactured, and it's called the Halligan Bar. So whatever the Duresta is, it's just a little bit of an ego boost. It's like one day, and it could be, it could be the ice pick. The ice pick could ultimately slowly become called the Duresta. Can Maybe you, it's the go kart. On? It could be the go kart. It could be the, the what's coffin going, shaped go kart. What? What? <laughs> yeah. What's going on with the go kart? 
I want to hear more about the go kart. Uh, I uh, well, I, I just because I'm always like kind of in this kind of like dangerous Eddie Monster theme stuff. I, I made the the go kart in the shape of a coffin, and <laughs> it's gonna look like a little coffin. We just made the motor mounts a couple hours ago. I'm gonna try and find a picture. I spin the computer around, but I'm probably gonna disconnect my hard drive, which has got a movie up on it. Um, but the go kart, uh, it's funny because I, I, every year I say I'm gonna do this and I blew it off, and so now I'm actually finally not blowing it off. But there's the, the go kart, it's like the coffin shape. Oh, yeah. And I did like the, the Batman logo and with my name on it. And uh, the idea, the, the idea uh, is just to inspire other people to make stuff. But it, what I can't do in performance, like I can't make an engine go super fast because I just don't have the technical know-how. I don't have that experience. Mm. I can make up foreign style. So I can make, give it a goofy style and plasma cut spider webs and make a bat shape and weld that to it and inspire people to think outside of the regular go-kart frame. But I have my buddy Art's going to show up with one that'll go 150 miles an hour on a regular go kart frame. But his creativity is in the engine, the gearing, the wheels, the brakes, you know, all like the deep technical stuff, which I just don't have enough experience with. He's not quite as much of a, a you know, a, so he, I believe he is an artist, but not in the way of like taking chances with the styling. He's more, his styling is really based completely on performance, which is to be appreciated. I feel like that's like a baker versus a chef. Mm -hmm. or like cooking versus baking so my neighbor uh my kids i have my kids riding dirt bikes pretty regularly my neighbor as well and he also just got an old go-kart from his brother um and it's like completely mangled welded together <laughs> a ton of different parts and it's so much fun to rip around like ev the kids love it um he loves it. We have it like all the time. Anytime we have a family party, like the go-kart comes out and it's still so much fun. I'm 36 and I'm like taking that over mound, <laughs> trying to get air with it with my like five-year-old next to me. And my wife's like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, I know. Exactly. It's like it, it definitely taps into the little kid and all of us, you know, the little dangerous kid. It's it's Absolutely. just so much fun. Um, we were we were wrapping up one family party the one time, and I see my neighbor Matt. He goes to leave, and the grass was a little bit slick, and he was like kind of scooting out to the side, and then caught a dry spot and just rolled the go kart all like watched the entire thing happen, and he just popped right yeah. out and like flipped it back over and was fine. But I was laughing like I'll still to this day text and be like, remember when you rolled the go kart at the family party? <laughs> <laughs> that's funny we had one around us too yeah, that, was no. a, that was a slick track so like they had the normal go-kart like track and then they had a slick track where it was basically metal or something and they would sprinkle this like powder on it um to basically make oh, it wow. like so drifting like slug? yeah jimmy it's that's it's, great. it's interesting like i think a lot uh, watching what you do i feel like um like Jesse James, right? Where he had his TV show and then he did Monster Garage. And I feel like he, you know, sure. that, that was his opportunity to kind of build his brand. And, you know, I think he mm -hmm. st obviously stepped away from that from a bit. But now, I, like, I follow what he does and he, it's very similar in the sense he wants to be in the shop. He wants to be making things. He's ma he makes, he hand makes. Yeah, I, you know, I, he's been a big, he's, you know, I, I've said it for 20 years if it wasn't for jesse james i don't think i could do what i'm I, I wouldn't be where i am you know because seeing what jesse james did you're just a dude making things in a shop and you know that's how i grew up i just didn't know that i could be a dude making things in a shop and be getting paid celebrity salary you know right. being a celebrity being a dude making things in a shop and you know being a celebrity is not really the goal the goal really is if I could be 100% honest, is to just inspire other people to do what they do. You know, like one of the most heartfelt moments in all of this is when I meet somebody that says, you know, I now have a successful business making cutting boards because I clicked on one of your videos. I never would have like gone down that path or at least not as soon as I did until, you know, you and, and Bob Claggett and Dave Picciuto and your crew of guys showed the world you don't have to be in rock star status to start a business and have fun you know and then and then what's even more 
beautiful is to see guys that do that then also start their own YouTube channel and then start getting branding deals. So now they're making money with their personal product, whatever it might be. And then they're also getting, you know, tens of thousands of dollars here and there to promote this glue or that cutting saw or whatever, you know. I'd say a, why not? I have a question re regarding that that we deal with with the podcast and um, you know, when you have vendors come across your plate and you had mentioned earlier that you said, you know, you'll, if it's a product you don't know about and they just want an ad read and you'll just read it, where do you draw the line between like for us, we, we want sponsors, we want vendors, we want partners, but we also want to remain authentic. So like, where do you draw that line? I draw line? the line at video games, <laughs> <laughs> video game ads. <laughs> I just, I never played video games in my life. Yeah. And, you know, I did do two video game ads and my fans were just like revolted. They're like, who the hell are you? You don't play this crap. And so now any video game things come in, I just pass on. I don't, I mean, I don't even answer them back. I just, you know, I, I also realize that you get bombarded with stuff. And I talk to some guys that haven't been doing it as long as me. And they're like, this guy won't stop emailing me. I go, why don't you just ignore his email? <laughs> well, Right. Okay. I'm like, stop writing back. Just to, you know, people feel like they have to answer every email. And people laugh at me whenever I go to shows. They go, can I open, open your phone? Let me see your email. See, look, I have 87,000 unanswered emails. <laughs> Those are just people that write me stuff I could see in the title. It's not something I should, you know, I could take the time to delete it. I just ignore it. It's also a lot, I have a lot of notifications turned on, which I shouldn't, you know, things, you know, when you sign into a website, it's like, you know, you have to click, I don't want to be notified. You don't have to click, I do want to be notified. So I always ignore those and therefore I get notified things I don't care about. So do you, do you feel like there's any um, preservation of your own brand when it comes to that, where it's like obviously video games, but um, even for, I guess, looking at it from our perspective where it's like, how many sponsors do we want? You know, how many ad reads do we want? How many partners do we want? Do we want a, mm -hmm. a small limited amount where it's very authentic? It's products we use or should we strike while the iron's hot? Like, I, you know, money. I try and I, I, I am not I've not been inundated to the point where I have to make that decision. You know, like I I have my ongoing brand deals, like, for instance, Carolina Shoe. You know, they pay me a certain amount a year. Uh, Starrett Tools, Lincoln Electric. Um, there's a few more where that's just ever present. And that's great. I, you know, I constantly do story type on glue. You know, these are things I use all the time. And then I'm always showing those brands off and I don't have to beat people up, but occasionally like some financial lending thing comes along and it's like, it's a quick 10 grand. I'll do the video. I'll put it in the beginning. So then the, the ad clients always happy if I put it right in the beginning. And then it's also a, a trigger to my fans to just scroll through the beginning. The logo is on screen. What I do is when I see an ad that has a logo on the screen, I use the logo as the marker to go f forward through it until there's no longer a logo on the screen. And that means the ad, the video starts, the ad is over. So I always do those things, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And I also turn off ads on that video. So if I'm getting a substantial amount of money to do an ad for a video, mm -hmm. my fans go, good on you, you made some money. But I also turn off the ads in the beginning. I turn off the mid rolls so that the only ad they get is the one that they have to watch and sit through me. That's super they don't smart. make them watch an ad and then watch me do an ad and then get a mid roll in the beginning. So, you know, I try my best to turn those off. Sometimes it's hard to turn off pre roll ads. You can go in and just check this post roll. So no one's going to watch a video after yeah. no one's going to watch an ad after a video. So sometimes I'll just choose that. So I try and alleviate the, you know, the annoyance factor. But like I said, I'm not getting those where like, it's like, I'm not posting every, I know some of my YouTube partners, some of my YouTube contemporaries will post, they will only post the video if there's an ad in it. Mm -hmm. A lot of times lately I'm posting ads that are, I do a thing with these guys called the Maker Mob, so they always have a lot of promotion. So I, I'll use, if I don't have an ad in a video, I'll put that ad in, I'll put a promotion for the Maker Mob or the guy that runs my website's like, hey, this week, you know, let's do a promotion where you buy an ice pick and you get a set of plans for free. So I'm like, all right, cool. So I'll do an ad for myself. And that's how we sell ice picks a lot. And do you, do you so ever get any kickback? Know what's going on. Do you ever get any kickback from yeah. like vendors where they want, a, you know, where it's like that song and dance, trying to navigate that, keep the relationship healthy, get them what they want, but also, you know, respect your own brand? 
Uh, you know, I everybody's been pretty good. You know, sometimes they want a pinned comment, which is okay because again, people just know, hey, look, the guy's just making a living. He's gives us because there's a lot of value. So yeah, I mean, that's the one thing I want to make sure people get a lot of value. And if they see me doing an ad, you know, there might be one guy that's like, that's it, I'm done, I'm unsubscribing. I'm like, and then someone in the will be like, hey, the dude's just trying to make a living. He's giving us quite a bit of free content over the years you know give them a break you know so my fans really stick up for me a lot which is great and uh the there's been only one time where i did i did i think i did it was when i did an ad for a video game and i knew i was going to get roasted in the comments i was getting roasted and i was liking the roasted comments like this game sucks you're an asshole for taking the money you're a money grabbing whore and i would like that comment <laughs> And then I got a call from my agent. My agent's like, hey, the brand wants you to unlike all the comments where they... Oh, <laughs> my God. I'm like, okay, I'll go back and unlike the comments that I liked. I was just like, what am I going to do? You know, I just, yeah. just show them like, hey, look, it's, it's, I'm not taking it all that serious. But it's one thing to promote the video, then it's also one thing to agree with the negative comments. But... It's just, it's like, whatever. I'm like, okay, whatever. In a week, this won't matter to anybody. What? Yeah, but Nick, that's like important for us as well because, you know, you go back and you have reviews and you have people engaging with you and there's a lot of positive support and feedback, but then it's like the person who says, hey, all of a sudden you have four sponsors and you never did before and it's just because of this or just because of that and you forget about all the positive support and you just focus on that one asshole. Yeah, that happens, of course. You know, I, I only try to do like, like in a video, for instance, I'm doing this boat video. It's going to be this, but it's all sponsors that are natural fit. It's Carolina Shoes. It's Total Boat. It's Bear Mountain Boats, the company that provides the, the, the plans. And it's Type on Glue. So there's four sponsors that are all integral to the process. I mean, yeah. well, Carolina Shoes, but that's, they're like the main sponsor because... You don't need shoes to build a boat. You do, but you know, it's cool to wear Carolina shoes because they pay me to say it. And I also do like their brand. And I, I've been to their factory and the people that work there are really good, nice, sweet people. You know, it is, made in America. Well, so. you, you mentioned an, an agent. What is, what is your agent focused on? Are they, are they filtering these deals? Uh, yeah, you know, when I get, for instance, I just got offered a, I just got asked to do a live engagement at Fabtech for some company. Mm -hmm. And I just, I said, thank you. I just CC'd my agent. My agent will handle it. And my agent handles it. And he'll get the most money, get me a first class ticket to fly there, whatever. Which is nice. I don't do that a lot. I don't do the public speaking a lot. I don't get offered that a lot. Sure. Uh, I would like to do that more often just because as I get older. You know, like right now, they're, they're pitching more television shows for me after... And I was like, I don't want a show where I have to like make a dinosaur every week. I'm 55 years old. My joints are starting to hurt. Jimmy, uh, the dinosaur my beard's with turning the gray. Who's gonna? The, the, the dinosaur Go spitting ahead. out tacos was pretty epic. Yeah. But uh, my kids, uh, and my kids watched it and loved it. And, and my my son loves dinosaurs. But I I've been wanting to ask this since we started in the show. You talk about your yeah. background in toys, but in the intro, I think you talk about how you hate kids. And that's why you yeah. got out of the toy making. Is is there truth to that, or is it for, was it for the show? No, well, the, the, I do hate kids, but <laughs> <laughs> that, I mean that makes I, it I will fun. never, I will never have my own kid. Uh, like it, me and Taylor Joker, I said it, when, when when it's time that you want to have a kid, I go we'll go to the orphanage and I'll uh, and I'll I'll adopt a fourteen year old kid. You would but adopt little, somebody else's kid prior to having your own. I feel like that'd be even tougher. Well. He'd be out of diapers, and that would be a big yeah. plus. That's what you're worried about. <laughs> I just, just like, I don't even want to put up with my own kids, and I made them. Like, could you no, imagine well, I, giving you somebody else's kid where it's like, I don't even have patience for the two that I made? Like, no, I, we don't, me and Taylor don't want kids. You know, like, she's younger than me. She's 20 years younger than me, and we've been together for a while, but all her girlfriends now, a couple of her girlfriends are having kids, and she's like, I don't want to know anything. No, at about this these point, kids. you can't have kids at this point. No. Your, your life would be ruined. No, no, no. I, I said to her, I go, if, if you ever wanted a kid, it's like, that's it. Nanny, I'll see the kid. You call me Uncle Daddy. That's it. Uncle Daddy. <laughs> I just, <laughs> Uncle when I, Daddy. <laughs> when, I, when I watch that, and it's like, and then the kids are on the TV asking you to build this dinosaur, 
and you're just like these kids are brats and i'm like man this show is either so well written or this is <laughs> this is this is the real jimmy that i like i've known you for years on youtube and and, and watch your stuff but i've never seen Thank you in that light and i'm yeah. like i'm i'm laughing out loud my kids are like what are you laughing at i'm like you just watch the dinosaur i'm watching him call all these kids little brats <laughs> It was really a concoction from Mike O'Dare, the producer of the show. He said, because I have this snarky behavior around TV people. And even with Mike, I love Mike, but he knows I'm a snarky asshole. And he's like, channel that towards this kid thing. So I channeled this like snarky, you know, like. It's so good. You know, the show notes and all. It's like, oh, come on. It's no big deal. Whatever, 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 whatever. But Mike, Mike really had the vision of making me this snarky asshole. And, and he, he. He was really his idea, and a lot of people love that aspect of the show. And I certainly have no interest in ever having a kid, so, so <laughs> it kind of fits. So you're, you're, you said that you want to get away from building dinosaurs, so making fun th this this show. Is, well, is I would no. I, I said that as a joke. Really, more about the physical. Like, I would yeah, love to right. do more of making fun, but I don't know if they're gonna. They, at this point, it's not in the cards. They haven't ordered it yet, mm -hmm. and you know now it's already midsummer. They're not gonna order it now. They're not gonna order it. Uh, you know, unless we're making things in the snow. That's a different story. But the uh, the idea is like TV networks don't pay a lot, and they don't. They certainly don't pay what I believe I'm worth. So. If I am going to do another TV show, I would like a gig like Kevin O'Connor, where I just come in and just talk to contractors. But I don't know if that's like my strong point. My strong point is showing off technical things. So I always have this fantasy of doing a show like Anthony Bourdain and going and meeting people that do what I do. Let them do the physical labor, and then I can come sit in for two days and interview them and then try some of their techniques and then leave. That's always been a fantasy show of mine. People, are, Every time I have a production company meeting, they're like, what show do you want to do? I was like, I want to do the Anthony Bourdain that meets people that don't have YouTube channels. His and stuff was so good and no so well written. I loved watching his stuff, yeah. even just like the narration of it that he wrote. And then I'm also older, you know. It's like, like I don't. It's kind of a little bit more of like a older, stately type of gig. Whereas, like, I'm I, to be running around on my hands and knees welding, doing mechanics. It's like, come on. Do you consider yourself stately? Yeah. No, <laughs> not at all, but what I mean to say is more like inspiring, like being able to tell a story. Jimmy is stately these I, I, days. No, what I'm saying is just like, you know, I would start wearing less dirtier clothes mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I'd probably wash my hands more often and then I'd go and meet uh, Lisa Sorrell, a bootmaker that we know in, in Guthrie, Oklahoma, and sit with Lisa and, you know, learn how to use her, uh, you know, welting you know, her machines and stuff like that. I think that could be an interesting documentary series, but you know, so unless with, somebody really invested time and energy in it, it's not going to happen. I mean, that I guess that's what I was going to ask. With your network, with your connections, with the exposure, potential exposure that you have, why couldn't you do something like that? Do you need to partner with somebody to be able to do that? Or could you find enough? Like and when I say partner with uh, actual TV, network would you be able to find um the financing for that elsewhere or like self-fund that honestly i mean i could but you know like i that's a good question and and when we did making fun you know there was a couple of glitches in the beginning when we were beginning to develop the uh the show contracts and stuff and you know the the cast and me and the cast a couple guys in the cast were like we could just do this ourselves yeah we could do the show ourselves even but then when they did the show and we saw all the extra editing, all the post-production interstitials and all that crazy fun stuff, which really great makes the show what it is. Like we look back and we go, okay, we couldn't do all that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we couldn't like somebody go get a, a golf cart and then a, an hour later, the $5,000 golf cart shows up and then we're cutting it apart. You know, we'd be like, okay, who's got the money for the $5,000 golf cart? Pat, you, Pat. Oh, no, 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 no. You know, so it's that type of budget that a TV show can bring you. Like if I wanted to do this travel show, I'm not going to up and go. I'd rather stay here and make a go-kart than go to Guthrie, Oklahoma in the anticipation of maybe making money down the road. I'd right. have to know that I'm getting paid now to go and do that. I, you know? I guess that's, what, and I'm thinking of it kind of, Nick and I have had this conversation where it's like, 
if we were to uh, produce more video content or take our podcast and visit other contractors, why wouldn't we be able to partner with a contractor who's using a specific product, ensure that our contract covers the cost of getting there, filming, profit, um, all of that to be able to produce like a, a essentially TV show type thing? Um, mm -hmm where we're guaranteed to be getting paid like through individual vendors it would obviously take a lot of legwork but that, and that's that's why you have line producers and you know mm. script coordinators and all those type of people that on a show like we just did that help all that like i never talked to those kids till they like, popped up on the screen i yeah. saw this guy tom like bending over backwards and turning himself into a pretzel going, we're going to be with you in just a minute. Just, could you just hold on? Jimmy and the guys are just making something right now. The, you know, he's in, behind the wall keeping this kid from hanging up on him. You know, <laughs> that type of, you know, there's so much infrastructure that goes into these shows, uh, any kind of show. And the other thing, too, is, is like that becomes e – doing all those choices and deciding all those things become easier if you have millions of viewers. And I'm not saying I have millions of viewers. I don't think I have enough of a – of uh of an audience to be able to go but somebody like mark roper who's puts a video out gets 10 million views in a day someone like mark roper can basically do whatever he wants yeah and what's funny is i don't know why he's not i don't know why he's not doing whatever he wants he probably is just having a much better time doing whatever he wants in his own backyard as opposed to like for instance i know that mark it was a big announcement and i have no inside information but it was a big announcement that mark has a deal with with Camelot, uh, with Kimelot, which is Jimmy Kimmel's production company, about a year and a half ago, Mark Roper is his video where the the porch thieves get sp with sparkles sprinkled on him created such a big buzz that that afforded him this TV show deal, and the TV still the show still hasn't materialized, and I can only imagine that Mark's got such autonomy over his content and his creation that now he's with a production company and then he's sitting there with somebody that has never made, uh, you know. A video that gotten any views much less yeah. millions and marks at the table and they're like wouldn't it be cool if if you made the the thing split dog poo and i could just imagine mark rope this is completely in my own fabrication none of this yeah. is anything i know but i could just imagine mark going okay i don't have to sit here and talk to five people that don't have any experience i can just go and make another 10 million view video on my own with my own production team i'm sure he's got a team mm -hmm. and not have to deal with this so that's in my own estimation, the only reason this show hasn't actually materialized yet. And I, I mean, that's kind of why I think that something like that would work for you as well, because I don't, I don't think that your brand and your following needs that production value to appreciate what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, right. so it's almost like it's like two different genres where you have the maker and those followers and then like the TV show and the production value that Netflix brings to the table are two different things where, yeah, you can get a $5,000 golf cart and chop it up. But like you could also go pick one up from an auto uh, like junction mm -hmm. and chop it up on your YouTube channel and probably get way more engagement. Yeah. So right. well, one, it's funny you reminded me. One of my favorite shows is uh, is uh, Roadkill, and then also uh, Vice Grip Garage is also a great show where he just goes and picks up a junker and fixes it and drives it home. But yeah, no, you know, at the end of the day, too, is it's the older I get, the, the less people I want to talk to. So when the sh when we found out the show wasn't being filmed, and I was like, oh wow, I'm going to have an easy summer. I'm not going to have to talk to 40 different people a day, and you know, get a uh, 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 get a COVID test every 10 minutes. Like literally I'd walk past the COVID test tent and they'd be like, Jimmy, Jimmy, you gotta get your COVID test. Jimmy, come on back. Come, come on, Jimmy. <laughs> and then I'd be like, I'll be there in one minute. And then like, I'd be getting COVID tested like 10 minutes before my first camera appearance. Cause I would just ignore them. And the, the girls, they were really sweet. They, they just, I was always just getting pulled in a lot of directions. And so I'd be like, I'll be right, I'll be right there. And then like, I'm about to go on camera and they're like, we need to stick this up your nose for just one second. I'm like, okay, you go ahead. All right, good too. Okay, now I'm ready. You know. See that, that's... And so the idea of not having people around me is more attractive than having people around me. And I think that, you know, that's the advantage that people have with the YouTube presence and with the social presence that like their following doesn't necessarily want that and i think that once you go to that and you have all of those investors and that big money 
um, and you have executives making decisions like that show's not your show anymore. It's, it's like funny. You, a lot of people still people are surprised that I shoot and edit my own video. I was like, people, like, why don't you get somebody? I mean, don't you have the money to get somebody? I'm like, yeah, I have the money to get somebody, but that means I have to feed them, entertain them, talk to them, share my ideas with them, listen to their ideas, which I know are not going to be any fucking good. <laughs> and I, you sound like so me. So that is why I don't have anybody around me. You sound exactly like me. <laughs> I'm the complete like, like, like I, don't, I, don't, I don't want people would around cool? me. Yeah. Wouldn't it be cool if you did that? I'm like, I'm 50 steps ahead of you. Stop getting in my way. <laughs> and so I'm like, the more you talk to me, the longer this is going to take. Just like, let me do my <laughs> thing and leave me alone. And I like, I've already thought about all of this and I've considered that's going to happen and this is going to happen and this needs to fall here. And you're like way behind me backseat driving right now. And I wish you would just leave. Yeah. And I'm getting hungry. My brother, my and brother, John, and you're annoying my, me. <laughs> my brother, John says to me, like, people will always like feed him punchlines. And he, he used to always say like when we were on shows together and people would feed him a punchline for something like he'd be like, he would say, I had 50 thoughts between when I stopped talking and you started talking. <laughs> <laughs> Basically saying I thought of that plus 49 more. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's true. I can. I mean, I'm all. I can do all the creative. I can be on camera. I cannot do the editing. And no. And like shout out to like I have Doug who works with me full time, and it's like he shoots yeah. and edits everything. I, I I'm fine doing everything else, but that it would I, it would never produce any content. So it's, it's, it's do that thing I did with MT Copeland where we filmed basically for two days and then they put out a plan on interior painting. They, you know, I had to go through and watch their edits and ensure that everything was in like a logical order. So I had to watch my course twice and I was so over it like because I did it once and then like I only had to watch it twice and I was done like how can i get through this faster this is good enough i and but i knew that like this is what i signed up this is what i have to do but i just can't imagine those people who are there and they're filming and then they're editing and going and watching that three four however many times they're having to do it it would just drive me nuts mm -hmm. i wouldn't be able to pay i'd be so zoned out i'd miss everything that they'd i'd be like oh yeah i already i already heard this like i'd be so zoned out i wouldn't be able to edit anything no, that's good enough. I, I well, already sometimes, heard that before. sometimes when I when I make a video that's really long, like the porch video is forty four minutes long. It's the longest video I've ever published in eleven years, and uh, that's my last video. And I got to the point where like I get it to, and then I watch it completely through, and then I watch it, and then it gets to the point where like okay, now I'm only going to watch this section that I fixed. Mm -hmm. If there's any glitches, I'll find out. If there's any background talk that I didn't want in it, I'll find out. The fans will tell me, and I just say okay. Whatever. I think I've seen enough of it in pieces to understand what the whole walkthrough is. But you know, when it gets really long, I start to lose interest in my own video, and I don't watch it com just to look for any glitches or you know, you move things around in the timeline, and they end up to pop up in the middle of something else by I, accident. I also you meant think to delete like, it. When you say like a w the same word over and over and over, it gets to a point where it's like, am I mispronouncing that? Yeah. Or it's like when you <laughs> spell it over and over, it's like, am I spelling that incorrectly? It's like <laughs> right. you just start questioning it. I, I rarely watch our videos all the way through. I'm, I'll maybe skim through and make sure like the parts that I, I was curious about. But beyond that, I'm like, I trust Doug. Uh, I trust him that he's he's got it. And, and same yeah. thing. It's like if there's something wrong with it, then we'll find out. Well, I'll tell you guys a little secret and people can't believe this that I, I didn't really I never watched Making Fun. I never watched it. You didn't. Not one of them. I didn't watch it. Was it good? It was good. The, 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 <laughs> Thank you. The, it was. It's the, tough to watch your uh, like I that that would be like John would be like, that. Oh yeah, like I listened to the podcast and I'm like, No, we recorded the podcast. Why would you listen to the podcast after like you were there? It does why would you want to? That's why I think well, it'd be so well, hard to be a to musician. Be honest, Oh, yeah. Well, I think a musician's a little different because you're like literally paint, making a painting, and I think you really got to listen to that painting. But when you're in it, for instance, I watched two episodes. at the. We did a little impromptu premiere at the... There's a hotel nearby that hosted the entire team mm -hmm. that was on the show, and so they became very friendly over three months with... the. Ho they rented the whole hotel, so they became very friendly with the staff, and they're a really great team of people over there in Wyndham. And... 
when they knew the show was going to premiere, because they stayed in touch with a lot of the folks in the team, they said, hey, why don't you guys all come back and we'll play the episodes in the theater here. And somebody's like, that's a great idea. So people flew back from California just for the weekend to watch. The, so like the whole team came back, a lot of the team, not the whole team. And we watched uh, three episodes, two episodes in the theater. And those are the only two episodes I watched. <laughs> how was, how was it? How audience. was it watching yourself? It was fun. It was yeah. it was fun. It's just a little goofy. That opening thing still cr- it's a bit cringy for me. But yeah, that's what I I just get so cringed out when I see. I'm like oh, I can't. That's not me. Like, yeah. do I really. Smile but it was all right. Like I mean, people. I, I get, so many people. The other thing too is I edit myself, and you know I don't I don't include my love handles, my bald spot, my gobble neck. I don't include any of that in my videos. But when <laughs> someone's editing me they get to look at me the way they see me all the time. And, you know, they don't realize I'm curating a very specific Duresta that people see, you know, one that's in good shape and doesn't have a, a turkey neck, you know. Jimmy, can you so break down, this- like, just, obviously I, I feel like YouTube will be will always be your center hub, but with, you know, mm-hmm. all of these TV shows that you've done, obviously there's more in discussion can you break down what it takes to to pitch a show? You know, I I, I, I think uh, you lot. know it's really it's just a, it's complete luck of the draw. You know, yeah. honestly, and people think it's easy for me to pitch a show. Hmm. It's more difficult because like you've had seven shows. Why have you had seven shows? It's like why have you had seven ex wives? Why don't you have just <laughs> one wife? <laughs> What's wrong with you? And that's that's what it gets down to. And it's. At this point, I am not pushing the show. I don't want it as much as the production company wants it. Mm -hmm. They have the vision. I'm still happy over here just making my YouTube videos alone, not talking to anybody. If a show (laughs) comes along, and and I I say this all the time as a joke, the reason why I do more uh, broadly branded things, more middle of the road type of things like a TV show, is because I want my retirement money. I want my retirement Chevy commercial. And I'm never going to get that being some rogue weirdo on YouTube. Mm -hmm. I'll get that if I'm more mainstream on Netflix or if I'm more mainstream on Discovery Channel. If I do end up there, I have more of an opportunity of becoming a Pawn Stars type of caliber. And I feel like if, if I ever got lucky to be in the caliber of like a Pawn Stars or, you know, this, this, the, what Jesse James achieved, I feel like I could, I could do well with that. I could take that opportunity and, you know, parlay it into Chevy commercials or, you know, being, uh, you know, a good mentor for young kids. Uh, you know, I feel like those are the only ways I'm going to get that sort of celebrity opportunity is by entertaining TV show ideas. Yeah. So that's why I still do entertain those ideas for that, like, super, super fund, super retirement fund, whatever it might be. You know, I make a lot of money now, but I don't make... I don't make fu money. I wouldn't make fu money. I believe unless I either hit it big with Walmart, which I'm in the opportunity to do, but you know it's mm-hmm. still taking a lot of work, or or entertain some of these bigger commercial ideas. But what's going to change if you have it, fu though. money? Um, I just I won't have to make a video once a week. I'll make a video yeah. once a month. That 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 will change. <laughs> Because <laughs> I don't have to do as many uh, audible ads. Yeah, or... I guess works le- work less. I, ju- I mean, you just don't seem like that. And you could correct me if I'm wrong. You just don't seem like the type that your lifestyle is going to change dramatically. No, no, not at all. Not at all. I mean, it's, I don't, I mean, the only, I guess I'd probably live more of a, I, I play a little bit more with my car collection. You yeah. know, I like more, I, I build more properties to house more cars. It's like there's up the road right now. There's this incredible place. It's not for sale, but I would like to own it. And I just made friends with the owner. I'm like, when are you going to sell this? He's like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Like sell it, sell it, sell it. But I don't have the money to buy it, but it's a fantasy of mine. Mm-hmm. It's this beautiful, incredibly, uh, it's a giant Morton building. It's probably uh, like 10, 12,000 square foot Morton building with like five garage doors. And it, it used to be a business, but the guy died. Now the guy that owns it just has it as an investment. He's rents out the bays. Like this would be the whole, my whole entire universe would be perfect in there, but I can't afford it. And if I, if I had my successful TV commercial, I would. It's, it's the it's commercial. It's, it's what you mean. It's funny. <laughs> you're chasing Chevy. I, I, I'm chasing GMC. So maybe we'll be on TV together. 
Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's great. I got <laughs> I got a couple of square bodies. Um, it's funny. I always joke. I always joke. I go. I always shit on Ford and Ram, and I said the only opportunity I'm going to get is I'm going to have to like. Ford's going to be like, we want you to push our new such and such. And I'm going to be like, Ugh, God, I have to go to the dark side. I told my dad. I, I said to my dad. It's not a video yes. game. You should be fine. Right. <laughs> it's true. I told my dad years ago, I was like, I'll never drive a Ford. And he goes, you really shouldn't say that. I'm like, I never will. <laughs> and he goes, you're going to regret that one day. And it's like, ever since he said that, I'm like, I, I can't buy, I can't buy a Ford uh, ever. You I've, know how I've, many I've times I look at like. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I own, I own a 67 F100 step side. I bought it sight unseen from a friend of mine. I gave him 2,500 bucks for it. We got in a fight and he never, he never delivered it to me. He never paid me back. So somewhere in Knoxville, Tennessee, I own a <laughs> F100 67 yellow step side. So if you see it, it's missing a front fender. Tell him I want my car back. Oh my God. Me and a buddy got into a fight over some stupid shit. And I just said, you know what, dude, I can't talk to you anymore. I, I, I never really cut too many people out of my life, but he's he's called me a couple times over the years, and we try to mend fences. But I'm, honestly, we won't be able to mend fences until he stops drinking, and that's part of the reason why he's he's a bad alcoholic. Mm. And uh, so anyway, if you see my yellow F one hundred sixty seven, and the only reason I bought it is because that's the year I was born. I'm like, okay, it's a sixty seven step side, mm -hmm. it's a Ford. He needed money, and so I was like, all right, I'll, I'll buy your car. I feel like that's but a TV show. We go, we go looking for the truck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, but you know, I, there's so many opportunities. I do like, I do like the brick nose Fords from the from the '80s. Those are kind of cool. But again, I, if I'm gonna spend ten grand on a brand new, on a really good shape, like a well maintained Ford, it would have to be given to me. I would spend ten grand on. It. I would look for the same quality Chevy square body. Like, yeah. Why would I buy a Ford? I just buy a square body instead. This is so much more classically designed. So, Jimmy, I, I have one last question I wanted to dig into. Mm -hmm. Youth. And as much as you hate kids, I know that mm -hmm. a lot of what you do is for ins inspiring others. What is your yeah. what is your general thought on youth and um, the trades and how in my opinion we've done a, a lot to uh, build interest in the trades but we haven't done mm -hmm. enough for educating the trades. yeah i think uh we have to bring back just like there are in many european and i know this because the fans tell me the european fans tell me oh i was i have to take woodshop class mm -hmm. i have to take this type of class i have to take you know general general adulting class like if we have to bring that back here in america that has to be wood shop and general shop classes in every school because when people figure this out on their own and they figure it out on their own they feel so empowered like you know they might be through college at a law school and now they realize they want to be a woodworker if they learned that when they were 12 years old and they had the passion for it then they could be a woodworker that learned how to be a lawyer it could be flipped you know it could be um i just think that somehow some way you know Ultimately, we need a president or somebody in you know big position of power that thinks it's important to bring industry back. And the only way we're going to bring industry back is to start teaching young kids that industry is something that they could potentially want to do. You know, it's it has to. People said to me in the beginning, they said, you know, is the maker movement? What do you think of the maker movement? I said it's going to create so many young entrepreneurs, so many young Elon Musk's are going to come out of the maker movement. It's going to take time, mm -hmm. but there's going to be so many young entrepreneurial guys developing startups. And, you know, if that was in every high school full time all the time, that would be I did a I did a lecture at a Saratoga Sharon Springs. I think Sharon Springs High School up here. One of the teachers was a fan of mine and said, can you come to career day? And I came to career day. I was like, hey, you guys know what a 3D printer is. And the kids didn't even know what a 3D printer was. Granted, this was a few years ago, but. I was like, how could like the art department not lay, like if I was an art teacher in a small little school, I, I like to think that I would just go buy a 3D printer yeah. or call up a company and says, hey, you make 3D printers? I'm a teacher in high school. Yeah. Would you send me one? Sure. What, what school wouldn't do that? You know, what, what 3D printing company wouldn't accept that sort of solicitation? Because then you're going to teach the kids how to print and their father's going to buy them one at home. It, you know. So a lot has to be done in this country to, to turn it around. 
Is there anything? And that you know, you... Uh, obviously, what we do on what we do on YouTube and social media has been a, a huge, a huge yeah. push. But you know, I find that the kids don't find us until they're a little bit older. Yeah. Beyond beyond what you're doing on social media and YouTube, is there anything that you are working on or would consider working on to help actually implement this in the country? Or, I mean, if if I've been in, you know, I wrote to uh, Mike Rowe. He never wrote me back. You know, I I would help if I could, but yeah. I don't hmm. know how or who. Sounds or who. familiar. <laughs> we had about <laughs> we, had, we had about a thousand people write to Mike Rowe to get him on this podcast, and he ignored all thousand of them. So, yeah, yeah, I don't know what's up with Micro. He seems like a weirdo. <laughs> Not saying he, he certainly. He probably has a hundred thousand uh, unread emails on his phone. Yeah. He, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> he uh, certainly, you know, did good for the for entertainment and what we do. He certainly, you know, did did a good job laying the foundation for the type of work that we do. There's no doubt about it. But it's just, uh, I don't know. I, I, I think I mean anything bad about micro. I, I I have nothing bad to say about micro. No, I, I I'm not. I just wish it was easier to get in touch with him. No, well, I called him a weirdo, but I mean, I shouldn't have said that. I take it back. I like micro. He's always been entertaining. But when it comes to this type of thing, I thought like he would have reached right back. Yeah. And the reason why I reached out to him is because Discovery Channel said, "Hey, when you're working with Discovery, you should work with micro." I said, "Okay, cool." Yeah. I sent him an email, and he never answered back. So that was 11 years ago. We should. We, we should, were both on the should, lineup at the same time. We should bump that email up in his inbox. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it, it. I think you're right. And I think that, and I only ask if there's anything else you're working on. I think what you're doing in general is huge. And the maker movement and everyone is understanding that it's, this is a really interesting industry to be in, to be blue collar, to be working with your hands and, and producing product or a service. There, there, it, it can be very lucrative and it can be a, a fantastic career. And the, I believe that the interest is definitely there. And I, I'm with you. It's the fact that education has uh, been removed simultaneously. And, yeah. you know, and what you're doing, what we're doing here, what we're doing on this podcast, what we're doing on social media and YouTube, it's all of this is, to des is designed to share and co collaborate and ultimately, you know, use that collaboration as education. Yeah. Well, you know, doing the TV show, I have so many, so many maker dads and moms saying the show really got my child out into the garage with me. That's so Whereas before crazy. they were never interested. They, they, you know, I showed them what I did. And now that they wanted me to make them a mini dinosaur, now they're, now they're interested in what I can do for them. That so that tacos. was, that was encouraging. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know, you know, if, I would have to have more episodes like that to to make a bigger splash but you know if that was my contribution I, I'd be happy to do that more often yeah but I mean obviously it would take a lot more legwork to have a more uh, substantial contribution but I also think just planting that seed in today's yeah. in the environment of today where kids aren't outside kids aren't building things kids aren't working with their hands they're not working in general I think that planting that seed in, you know, our youth is just as important as kind of cultivating that after it forms. Like we, we need that spark. And I do think that the maker movement and YouTube and where these kids are turning to kind of educate themselves, that's the catalyst for a lot of this change. And I think that, you know, the next step mm -hmm. is kind of structuring that education a little bit more, but just getting kids into it or exposed to it in the first place is huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Big, 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 big deal. You know, I, I remember as a kid, the uh, art teachers encouraging me. And then when I was old enough to go to my first woodworking class, you know, be being part of that. Was, I remember that. I remember because my brothers were doing it. Well, Jimmy, for someone that doesn't like to be around people or talk to people, we certainly appreciate uh, you hanging out for two hours. <laughs> Thanks, man. No, thanks. It was a good. It was a good talk. You guys got to let me know when this publishes, and I'll tweet it out or whatever. Fantastic. Yeah, we'll get you all the uh, the credentials. And again, thank you so much for being on and yeah. for everything that you do for the makers and this industry as a whole. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks, and thanks for you know, like I said, being patient with me. My uh, my Mr. Magoo attitude towards never remembering anything and constantly moving appointments around because I missed them. Well, I Thank hope you. that you remember that Tyler and I will be 
in New York next July 3rd with a go-kart that's going to kick your ass. So. <laughs> Not this July 3rd. Not, Not this, this July, July I don't 3rd. have time. I, I can't soon. get a go-kart built in, in 15 days. Too soon. Well, you could pick one up on the way. Okay, Maybe but I'll stop. I'm not going to press you. All right, all right. I'll, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> Facebook Market, just to right. click away. Go karts are just going to be world. ripped off Facebook, and they're all going to show up in New York. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jimmy, thank well, you so thanks, much. Well, thanks, guys. Man. It was a good talk. Yeah, yeah thank you. I appreciate right, your cool. time. I hate kids. <laughs> Dude, you got to see that. You got to watch the intro because it's literally him talking about like. I left the toy business because I hated kids, and I went off to do other stuff, and here I am making ki making toys for a bunch of little brats. But and I like I like I feel like I like that dynamic where like you oh, have the so kind of the funny. curmudgeon where it's like then you get them around these just little kids who are maniacs, and they're like they're just way too much. It, it's like listen, Jimmy has made an amazing brand and and an amazing life for himself around makers, but this show it's on Netflix. It's it's so funny because they're they're the kids are obnoxious too. Yeah, like, I want a dinosaur that pukes tacos. All and kids he, are and, obnoxious. And, and Jimmy's like, "What the heck? I'm not building that." <laughs> and they're like, "We're building that." And then it's like, "Shit!" And then they build this giant like eight foot dinosaur that literally pukes out tacos. And he's got one of his guys underneath. They got the slow mo and like tacos are like falling into his mouth. It's just like, and of course the kid, my my kids are like. This is awesome. <laughs> I'll have to check it out. Uh, but yeah, if you guys if you guys don't know who Jimmy is, Jimmy Duresta, D I R E S T A. Uh, just type that in, in Google. You'll find his YouTube. He's got like two million subscribers. Um, a, a healthy social media following across all platforms. But YouTube, that's where I found him. I, I years ago, and it, when he talked about like the no the no talking videos and like the it's just like these like hyper lapses of like what he's doing yeah and it's just super super entertaining and obviously extremely viral um yeah he just he's a cool dude yeah i um <clears throat> it's the the conversation and talking to him and kind of seeing what he's doing you can tell that you know his entire life he didn't realize that this could be his main source of income like this yeah. was always just this is what i want to be doing this is my passion i like tinkering i like being by myself i like building things making he wants to you know express himself artistically um and he was oh it's almost like he's always making other moves to make that happen when making that happen is already doing that where like like his main following his primary following and his support structure is all based around what he does in his shop and making these videos yeah. um and that's like it's right in front of him you know what i mean yeah i think it's uh, i think there's so many so many things we talked about from the art world like the perceived value of art to you know him on the hunt for that one thing that you know when he mentioned silly putty like that is such a, a silly thing to relate to but think about what that is and what it did to that the toy world yeah like how successful that tiny little one piece product was um it is it, it's yeah fun. and it's like, like you can't break it there's no callbacks there's no returns no like it's one and done out the it's door like, and that's it like money yeah. paid and you know there's a there's you don't have any operating expenses at that point like for the life the shelf life of that product well guys uh next week who do we got coming up uh let's see here today i just have... had about a million emails come in all at once um <laughs> i feel like it's been insane and i'm just like deleting one after the another and definitely deleted who was up next well we got south coast ad Oh yeah, uh, next week. So, um, trade. He wants to talk about trades management, but I think he's he's the one working on rockets. Yeah, he sent me videos of like, like he supervises rocket scientists. Yeah, so he's got a YouTube. I actually just saw it in our link here. So I'm gonna have to check that out before next week. But we'll be chatting with him. I don't know how to pronounce his first name. It's like Brio. Maybe. Mm, I don't know. I've B always just known him as South Coast Dad. Yeah, it's B R I O U. Brio? Brio. 
I'm, I'm, everyone's like, you're an idiot, Nick. Yeah, Let's seriously. Just, <laughs> we'll find out next week. And then, what do we got for? Oh, we gotta, we gotta give away some swag. Let me see here. We have. Let me. See. Let's pick this one here. Hold on. Nope. Oh, there's no. Oh, there, here we go. These guys are hilarious and knowledgeable. I'm always learning ways to improve my work inside and out on the field. The guests are always a one as well. By the way, Chuck highs are better than lows. Another Dude, high. every nobody wears Chuck lows. I'm, I'm clowns. Wear, I've switched to high top vans. White high top vans are good too. Okay, I'll all do right. both. In vans, I'll do both. All right. Uh, well, I got I got all black ones too. But I feel I you know what I do the all white because people say I can't walk the job side in all white. So I'm just like, eh, screw you. Uh, but that's Brian Sherlin at Brian Sherlin. Brian, I'm gonna send you a DM. Uh, on Instagram, we'll get your contact info and your site. Yes, I have those vans, those exact yeah. ones. I'm wearing white. I have the all white ones too, but I got them for a for a uh, Halloween costume. Well, if you don't <laughs> want them, I'll take them. But Brian, we'll send you a DM. Uh, if you guys want some swag, uh, you can do two things. You can hit our Instagram, click the link, head head over to the Upstate Merch Shop and buy some. Uh, if you if you do, make sure you post it so we can reshare it. Uh, and if you want a chance to win some, head over to iTunes, drop us a five-star review, and let us know why you love this show. And I'll send extra swag uh, if you're a low-top Chuck kind of guy. Nah, people are just going to say it. You can't lie. you got to prove it. you got to prove it. Guys, we'll see you next week. Thanks to our sponsors, Duration, uh, Molding and Millwork, Rockwool, and Upstate Merch. <laughs>